Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I, I, I want to start with the uh, uh, announcement that um, Tony, the chair, won't be attending today. So uh, uh, the vice chair, uh, Damon, will step in and uh, run the show today. Ready to go. Krista, can you start with the roll call? Okay, now that the clock's done. Damon Doyle, Vice Chair and Chair Pro Tem. Uh, present. Chell Anderson. Here. Jay Arnold. Here. Todd Bayruther. Oh. Micah Chappell. Micah is raising hand, so I, I'm not sure if he has audio issues or. I'll get him promoted to panelist. Okay. Al French. Bob Hamlin. Here. Roger Haringa. Here. Matthew Hepner. Craig Holt. Here. Peter Rieke. Here. Katie Sheehan. Here. Caroline Traub. Here. Corey Wilker. Here. Todd Bayruther. Al French. I see Todd here. I don't know uh, what's. I guess he's having connection issues, so he comes and goes. Al French, Matthew Hepner. Okay, ex officio members, uh, Representative Larry Hoff. Representative Alex Rommel. Good morning, good to see everybody. Senator John Lovick. Senator Linda Wilson. I am here. Uh, Lauren Lathrop from the Department of Labor and Industries. I am here. And our assistant AAG, uh, Derek Mir Bakhtal. Morning, Krista. Good morning, everyone. I apologize for that. And Good we day. do have a quorum. And I just saw, I just saw Todd Beiruter. Yep, I'm here. Thanks. Damon, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, item two on the agenda is to review and, review and approve the agenda. Uh, do I have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, review and approve the minutes for 1021 and 114. Stoyan, I did not see the 11-4 minutes. Uh, we, we couldn't finish 11-4. Uh, uh, Annette was out most of the week. We are close to the end, but uh, we couldn't finish. And uh, we'll finish the minutes next week. So we'll have them on the website, the draft on the website for your review. OK. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes from uh, October 21st? So moved. All second. Okay, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
motion carries. Uh, any public comment for items not on the agenda? Uh, I'm assuming, uh, Stoyan, you're looking for a show of hands if there's any public comment. Uh, I see two raising okay. hands. Uh, I do not have that on my end. So if you could uh, would be so kind as to call on those people. Ken Boulet. Hi, is it uh, possible to make me a panelist so I can turn on my video and share my screen? Thank you. I, I would I would approve that. He he was promoted before he asked. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Kim. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I had tried to send in an uh, emergency rule uh, request on Wednesday, and unfortunately, Storian mentioned that they were having some tech technology issues, and uh, he wasn't able to even see it till Thursday. So I have two that, and I, and I know you, you guys aren't going to probably act on them, but I had... Um, actually two proposals that I would like to discuss and um, it quickly I'd like to bring up why I'm bringing this to your attention since uh, again I'm Ken Brulette with Seattle Fire Department and I was or still uh, am I hope a member of the the technical advisory group for the fire code um, when we reviewed chapter 12 of the uh, 21 fire code uh, we made one small uh, proposal change but um, we didn't really address energy storage systems in a whole. And on Wednesday, I attended a webinar that was put on by the Washington State Department of Commerce. And it was also attended by um, other fire departments throughout the region and the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Uh, Matthew Pace was there as a presenter. Um, and it, it really enlightened how far behind Washington State is in with our codes and energy storage systems. So I have two proposals um, that I'm trying to push forward. And, and the reason it didn't go forward with it when we did meet as a tag is just didn't know that this was the emergency, emerging industry that was just coming at us really quickly or we would have done something before. Um, and I'm going to start with the 2018 code. Uh, says another participant is sharing. So I'm just wondering if. Yeah, I think we need to take the agenda down perhaps. Yeah, it's, it's available now. Okay, thank you. All right, so the first one's relatively easy and, and this is more of the emergent net. Uh, needs is the 2018 code itself. And I'm just talking about the scoping section in chapter 80. The fire code right now um, references that all of the NFP standards and they're normally linked to a specific section. Chapter 12 is energy, um, uh, energy systems. And in the scoping section, I would like to add in here that the AJ can use NFPA 855 and then chapter 80 reference NFPA 855. Right now, the AJ is just handcuffed with these energy storage systems getting installed throughout the state and we don't have the associated laws to govern them to make sure that they're installed correctly. The only document that's available quickly for us is NFPA 855 in the 2023 edition. So this is a quick change Chapter one of the fire code allows anything that's referenced in our fire code to be considered part of the code. And that's what this does. It just says, okay, 855 is part of the code and we can use it just like any other reference standard. So that's what the 2018 proposal is for an emergency rule to get this in effect so we can uh, actually use 855. The um, other ask would be that since the 2021 code is actually going to be in effect uh, July 1, we need to amend the 21 code. The 21 code brought in a whole bunch of energy um, storage uh, language, which is fantastic, but it still didn't keep up. So the 2024 IFC 
has worked with the language that's in the 855 and, and updated it. So my next proposal is a little bit longer because um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but it's to update the 21 code with the 24 language. And that's all it is, is, is we would take everything that's in the 21 code, which is in black, and anything that's in purple here would be the updates. Just And all I'm doing is just bringing in the 24 language, which we're going to see in the state of Washington in a few years. But unfortunately, we need that language now. So there's all of these updates in the 1207 section that need to be done. Now, I understand that um, both of these are some big ask right now for emergency rules, but I would be hoping that you guys at least look at the 2018 immediately. And if you did want to establish a work group, a quick work group, similar to the R4 work group that I was hoping would have already gotten started from your last meeting, to work on the 21 emergency rule quickly to make sure that in July 1, we have all of the 24 language moved into the 21 code so we can address the energy storage systems that are being installed um, within the state right now. So thank you very much. I hope I didn't take up too much time and, and uh, I will relinquish the screen if I can. Mr. Chair, can I, can I clarify the process? Yes, please do. So it, it, it's not really an emergency rule because, I mean, the court is not effective yet. So, uh, it, it, you know, if, if, the, if the council decides it would be an off-cycle rule, but uh, it, the proposal was submitted even Wednesday was too late for this council meeting. And uh, it wasn't a direction, but a recommendation by the council a few months ago because we were getting too many requests for emergency rules at the last moment if we can have at least a month for the council staff and the council members to evaluate the project, if it needs some research and stuff. So I will make this available uh, at the council meeting in, uh, uh, for the council meeting in January. And, uh, and then, you know, based on the discussion and what the council decides, uh, we, we have enough time if we need to do, uh, you know, a work group and uh, additional work. That, that's from me. Okay. Uh, Jill, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> and I have a question. What is the scale of this energy storage solutions that is to be regulated? Is it is it the, the Tesla battery pack in your garage or is it a building that has um, a room that's very large and has um, batteries in it, for example, or is, is all, yes. all it? Yeah, it, it's, it's both of those. The, so the 21 fire code already addresses those, um, both of those scenarios. So mm -hmm. um, the, the 21 code basically for the houses, for residences says, hey, if you install one that is um, already built to this UL standard, then all of these additional rules um, Apply, you know, don't apply. You just want to make sure that it's a UL listed uh, device that gets installed. So it's a little lenient on that. The 24 code brings in um, some more provisions that weren't in the 21 code. And uh, there would be some correlation with the residential code that would have to happen too. So um, yeah, a work would, would be helpful. So it's about larger scale storage than about yeah, that. The two, yeah, we have it's both. So you you have the larger scale storage and then the smaller um, energy storage systems for residences. Two different sections in 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 uh, chapter twelve that deal with it right now. Okay, and then we've talked a lot about the the timing of the the code coming out and the fact that that people or code officials get a version of the code and then when something comes out a month later they might not get it or they might not be aware of it. Um, so. I guess if we did an emergency or if a, we did a rule change for the 2021 code early next year, would it be part of the July 2023? Uh, so we set a schedule uh, in our last code meeting. We, we actually voted on it, I think, um, that we would have, to the extent possible, staff prepare provisions by a certain date such that code officials and, and builders and everybody would would have enough notice of, of all the things. And I guess if we do an emergency rule next year, are we, or, or a, a rule change next year, are we gonna be able to stay on that timeline? And that's a question more for Stoyan and, and others. Well, it's important how much extra work 
you're giving me because so far we have requests for two or three uh, uh, off cycle rules and uh, this in addition. So you add one more and you required me to develop insert pages by uh, April and a and, and bunch of other stuff. So uh, I, I don't wanna, I don't, I don't have a, a, an opinion now on this proposal because I didn't have enough time to review it, but uh, you know, we can do so much. If we get too, mu too many projects at the same time, we, we have to prioritize. The, the, the first proposal though was relatively quick. It wasn't, a, it was just adding in NFPA 855 as a reference document for the 2018 right now. And, and that's something that I, I did it separately just because I understood that a work group would take some time. Yes, I would love for it to be part of the 21 code as an amendment at the state in, in July, but the real need right now is for the 2018, and that's what the emergency rules are all about. If we find that there's a discrepancy and we don't have an available code or document to enforce, that's why I brought that forward to just adopt the NFPA 855 as a reference document. Okay, uh, Micah. Thank you. Um, I do see the need for this, especially the 2018 portion of it. And I, I don't see an issue with an off cycle rule beginning early next year. Um, I think that's what the process is here for. I guess I am understanding things differently. My understanding is this code is adopted once it is filed and the IFC has already been filed. If you go into the WAC rules, the effective date of that language that it will be implemented is July 1st, 2023. However, it is already adopted. So with that, the only process to modify that adopted language currently would be an off cycle rule. And if that's done before the implementation date, that's fine, but that would be my understanding. And maybe Stoyan or Derek can speak to that, but it seems like we could get this done even if it is considered an off cycle rule prior to the implementation date of July 2020, of July 1st, 2023. However, I don't think it would change anything in the um, needed information for code officials as a way to adopt, adopt things. There are open questions on these systems. We do have a section in the, uh, the Washington IBC or the Washington Building Code and the Washington Residential Code on energy storage systems. And so having the, the comprehensive package on what to enforce, how to enforce it, and what documents to go to, I think are very important here. So I would be definitely open to um, moving forward the reference standards proposal or nest needed there for 2018, and then doing the off cycle rule for the rest of it early next year. Thanks. If I can, if I can, if I can add something, and that that's my request for the council members. So I, I didn't have enough time to evaluate both of this. Uh, I didn't even see one was for 2018. I didn't have enough time. So based on my brief evaluation, I would say this doesn't meet the criteria for emergency. And, I, I, and I'm sure Micah will say, oh, you're wrong. And, and Ken, the same thing. I may be wrong. I just didn't have enough time to review it. And I think the same applies to the council members. And uh, I, I, I've made this speech before several times. We have like 15 emergency proposals for two years. That's too many. Uh, and and, um, and my request for the council members is please take, take your time and evaluate what we have. This is what, all I'm asking. Uh, the other thing is if I ask you, let's make rulemaking every 18 months or every 12 months, one triennial and every year. How, how you will evaluate that? You will tell me you're crazy. Probably I am. But now we have rules every month. Not every year, every month. So this affects designers. Uh, this affects uh, enforcing agencies. Uh, and uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this meeting, but I, I, I can prepare something else for, for the next one. Okay. Uh, what, when is our next meeting, Stan? Do you, do you have January. a date? January. What day in January? Uh, I think it was 20 or 21st. I can't remember. Okay, so we're, we're talking two months away. Yes. Okay. Um, 
it would seem, in, in my opinion, it seems like the first request is rather simple. It's just adding a reference standard. Um, the second one, of course, uh, would take a little bit more evaluation. Um, Ken, could you clarify, you said the language you showed that was in purple, that was uh, um, the 24 proposal from the IECC it, it, or that? Exactly, it's, it's all 20, uh, 2020, contract. it's all 2024 international fire code language. It's already been approved. It's just moving it into the 2021 Washington State Fire Code. So there's nothing that she, you know, nothing specific. It's just bringing it in early. It's something that we've I've already done in chapter three of the 2021 uh, fire code, but unfortunately did not get it in, um, did not know it was, it was needed as much as what I have just found out recently that these systems are just popping up everywhere and we're lacking a reference to 855 and then the 2024 language. So um, we're, I'm it's a stopgap. I'm trying to do everything I can to to catch up. It's what industry is designing these systems to 1855, but we don't. The AHJs throughout the state don't have the ability to use that. Now, I got to remember that I'm talking about the state, city of Seattle. I have already done an administrative rule for the city of Seattle that helps us bring forward um, the 2024 language. But I'm not here on behalf of helping just city of Seattle. I'm here on behalf of helping the rest of the state that has to deal with these systems that are being installed. They don't have the same abilities as the city of Seattle to make these administrative rules uh, to bring forward earlier code language. That's why that 2018 reference to 855 is so important. Thank you. Joe. Thanks. Um, I can say from the design perspective, we're hearing and working with a lot of our clients on systems like this. So. Um, we, we know that they're they're coming a lot faster than, than we expected as well um, for the architecture and, and engineering perspective. Um, I guess Ken and, and maybe Micah, um, would an opinion be okay? Is, is it is it that you need this to be enforced so you can in, in, in place so you can enforce it? Or is it you want the ability to to talk about it so an opinion would be an acceptable way of looking at it? I really think the emergency rule, the quick emergency rule to the 2018, what like the chairman said, it's a simple one. It's just referencing it and a 855 to bring it in as a part of the code right now. The other part of it, um, yes, it's for the 21 code. I don't think opinion, opinion doesn't help the jurisdiction with regards to actual enforcement. It's just that it's an opinion and the AHA can take it or leave it. Okay, Micah. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Story, and it's things, whether or not they rise to emergency rules or not are, are questionable. And I wasn't indicating that we should adopt one today. That's why I didn't make a motion. So um, I don't disagree with you, whether you think so or not. Um, but I do think that that is the purpose of the SPCC and there are outlines and guidelines on how to do this. Um, one of those is the RCW or Excuse, yeah, the RCW that says the immediate adoption amendment or repeal of a rule is necessary for the preservation of public health, safety, or general welfare. If the fire departments are coming in saying these are an issue and just heard from Shell that they are here and the designers are having to deal with this, whether or not it's capturing everything, it sounds like this is something we should take a significant look at early next year. Um, and then the council can decide today if they want to adopt the reference standard, which I don't think would be functioning as an opinion based on the fact that it's not adopted in at the state so um it'd be something that probably does need to be adopted some way shape or form in the near future thanks okay any other comment from uh, uh the public or the council does any anybody want to take a, an action on this uh i think there are I think I saw raised hands. Uh, Dustin, can you can double check that? I see uh, two raised hands attendees, and I'm not sure if they want to talk about this proposal or about something else. 
if, if anybody, uh, if any of the raised hands want to talk about this proposal, uh, keep your hand up. It looks like uh, Kathleen. Sorry, is not on this. Topic. Okay. Sorry. If you could pause for a second, we'll come back to you. Uh, Matthew? Yes, hello. Can you everybody hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew Pace. I'm a technical advisor with Pacific Northwest National Laboratories. I'm speaking in support of the both of the rule changes that Ken has presented. Um, as he had mentioned, I uh, was a uh, um, moderator and supporter of a conference put on by uh, Commerce this week that was attended by a number of members from the state. And one of the challenges that we see as a national lab as we try and support the uh, deployment of energy storage on a wide scale basis is the inconsistent adoption of energy storage codes across the US. Um, one of the challenges that we're seeing across the US is the emergence of moratoriums by communities based on either uh, gaps in the code or education uh, of you know, various agencies. And that was a focus of this webinar that was held this week was trying to identify some of those gaps. Washington State is at a disadvantage in being able to support the rapid deployment of energy storage because of some significant safety gaps that's in the current code. Um, the 2024 IFC language uh, very closely harmonizes with NFPA 855 and addresses some significant shortfalls. So from a safety perspective and to provide a pathway for newer technologies, uh, we would like to you know, support the commission in uh, spending the time necessary to bring forth this language uh, in, in the July period. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Greg Rogers. You had your hand up. Yep. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. So the, uh, my name is Greg Rogers. I'm with the Spokane Valley Fire Department. Um, I'm, I've am i also been involved in code development for well over 24 years. I've set the last three cycles on the International Fire Code Development Committee um, as a committee member representing the International Association of Fire Chiefs. I, I, I want to share with you that we really support the adoption and moving forward with what Ken is proposing. Um, and, and I'll propose a couple of different things to you. In the Before the end of this year, the International Association of Fire Chiefs is going to come out with an urgent bulletin in regards to this industry and these uh, types of devices and encouraging states and jurisdictions to move forward with the 2024 language. I can't tell you in the 24 years of my code development process of the International Fire Code, and I can tell you I was around when the Uniform Fire Code became the International Fire Code and the International Fire Code was the first one in, 20, in, in, in 2000. Um, and I can tell you based upon this, we, we are seeing an industry and we are seeing a movement that has been unprecedented in anything that we've had. Um, you can't even compare it to the hydrogen fueling that we had to deal with in the code cycle uh, many years ago, probably 10 to 15 years ago. Um, and I think that's the reason why it's important to understand what Ken's saying in regards to emergency rulemaking. I understand that you guys have a lot of issues that are being addressed, but I can tell you there, I, I've never seen anything or an industry moving as fast as this. I can tell you part of the safety features, and I, I appreciate Mr. Anderson bringing up the Tesla uh, battery walls um, that is addressed in here, but it, it, to be realistic about it, those are minor features compared to what we are seeing in the industry of 20 megawatts shipping containers that are being installed in jurisdictions that uh, have no requirements in the code or no enforceable requirements that are being adopted. And I know from a fact after attending a couple of meetings over the last couple of days, 
There's large scale industries that are bringing these types of devices in that do not meet uh, UL approval or UL standards. And the unfortunate piece is, is for jurisdictions like myself and other fire jurisdictions around the state, they don't have the capability of using that NFPA standard or document to apply that. So I, I want to encourage you to continue to move this forward. And it would be my hope that you could potentially add it to the 2021 uh, code, hopefully before the July date. Because I, if, for my perspective, it's kind of like Ken said, along with my jurisdiction, it's, it's not us that are very knowledgeable about this that need this adopted. It's for those folks that don't really understand what's coming to their jurisdiction. Okay. I thank, thank you. you Greg. Thank you, Greg. Um, I don't see any other hands up. Stoyan, could you uh, be sure to forward the information you received on Wednesday out to the council so that we can uh, consider this at our next meeting? The information, the information is uh, uh, saved on the web page that uh, we, we sent you a link for. So uh, regularly, you can you can check this web page. Everything that comes, we're saving it there. And uh, uh, for this particular one, I can uh, I can email it to you. Uh, okay. All right. Any other comments on this? Thank you, Ken, for bringing this forward. Uh, is there any other public comment on items that are not on the agenda? Kathleen. Hello. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I am, my name is Kathleen Petrie and I'm speaking on behalf of King County and I would like to speak uh, regarding some of the content in the document entitled changes from CR 102. Would that be acceptable today? Uh, sure. Great. Thank you. Uh, we would like to speak in support of requiring a dedicated branch circuit for EV charging in section R30962, but we are not in support of the exception. Washington, along with 16 other states, has laws requiring state emissions policies to mirror those of California's Air Resources Board, requiring 100% of new passenger vehicle sales to consist of zero emission vehicles by 2023, with a uh, phased in of 35% by 2026. Tightening that timeline even more is uh, 20, the 2022 Move Ahead Washington package uh, that now has a bold new policy aimed at ending sales of new combustion engine vehicles starting in 2030. Buildings built to this code will be occupied in 24, 25. Do we have enough EV infrastructure to accommodate the influx of electric vehicles, especially with the reduction in EV infrastructure granted to A, E, and M occupancies approved in the 2021 Washington State Building Code? The exception in, that is proposed still requires the electrical service to be sized to accommodate the 40 amp circuit. It just doesn't require the installation of the circuit associated wiring in the outlet or junction box. It will be less costly to do this now during construction versus as an alteration later, and it is the cost is nominal. Uh, knowing that combustion engines are phasing out quickly, it seems prudent that homes are outfitted with the capability to charge our vehicles this code cycle. So uh, thank you very much for your, uh, the opportunity to speak today, and we request that the exception please be removed. Okay. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. So this was for agenda item uh, six, I believe. Um, uh, the exception is there because there was some debate at the last council, uh, on, uh, actually on October 21st meeting. So the exception is there uh, for discussion, discussion purposes, but uh, this was for agenda item six uh, and we shouldn't be accepting public comments for the adoption of the codes, except uh, the council members have uh, questions uh, or uh, uh, need additional clarification uh, pertaining to uh, changes to the CR-102. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other public comment on items that are not on the agenda? I don't see any hands on my end. So with that, we'll go ahead and move on to item number five, uh, request for opinion considering the use of R4 occupancy as alternate approval. For uh, item number five, we have two different opinions saved on the website. So the first one, uh, the council staff developed based of the comments we heard at the last council meeting. And the second one, uh, Micah took a different approach, uh, pointing to uh, a different section or to a general section. So I posted both uh, because Micah's option is completely different. So I can make both of these 
uh, opinions uh, available on the screen. You just let me know which which one I need to uh, show you first, and then I'll do it. Um, let's let's go ahead and take them in order. Take the the first one first. Okay, give me a second. So the question is the same. Uh, and the answer was modified based on, again, it was uh, Chell's idea. Um, I took the, uh, it wasn't it wasn't a motion, but uh, I, I listened to a discussion uh, and the uh, Department of Health added a sentence so here is the short version of this. And the other one again was submitted by um, a Micah. Uh, thank you, Micah. Yeah. He was in a difficult working conditions, I guess, at the time, but I can, I can show you uh, Micah's option as well. I'll try to share them. Okay, here is the other one too. Okay, I'm gonna assume that the uh, two hands that are up, uh, Angelina and Al, are uh, for discussion on this proposal. So with that, uh, Angelina, go ahead if you'd like to, to comment. Hi, good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes. Wonderful, thank you. And I appreciate the proposals on the screen. Um, I'm the executive director for AMF and Healthcare in Washington. And I just wanted to provide a little context of um, why this is, you know, I've, I've been attending each of the meetings and um, I understand that it wasn't accepted as an urgent or emergency, um, but the letter, the content of this letter is so vital. Um, so we currently have two proposed eight bed residential programs that have been a complete standstill for several months. Um, we have the locations, we have the homes, they're outfitted, they're furnished. We're literally waiting on the outcome of this code to determine what safety measures we need to have installed. Um, so we've been at a standstill and that's you know due to this gap in the code and the differences in the interpretations between DOH and the local officials. Um, so I just asked for a really clear language showing a pathway for us to move forward. And as discussed in the previous meetings, you know there is this urgent need for additional mental health services. We've had support from the governor's office. NAMI submitted a, a letter of support as well. Um, and many other community members and providers. And so just, you know, really emphasizing every day that we are delayed in opening um, is directly impacting human lives. So I just ask that we have really clear language uh, so we can move forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Al, Al, Al Spalding? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, fantastic. I, I thank you. Uh, I, I'm the proponent for this request. Uh, and. I am not wed to either one. Um, uh, I like Micah's version. Uh, thank you, Micah, for putting this out. Um, and I think the 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 modified version with uh, Chell's suggestions works as well. Uh, I think it's just a preference for the council at this juncture because I don't think we're talking about any opposition to this opinion uh, at this juncture. This is the fourth meeting that we've talked about this opinion. Um, so, I mean, if there's a preference, I, I would, I think both would work for the purposes that the Department of Health and, 
and the providers are looking for, as, as well as providing some clarity to the local authorities having jurisdiction. So I appreciate your consideration of either one. I don't have a preference. Okay, thank you, Al. Uh, Ted. Hey, uh, thanks everyone. Ted Gastello, CEO, AMFM Healthcare. Uh, I really appreciate the council continuing to consider these measures. It's incredibly important. Um, it really is an emergency. I have been doing some research with the University of Washington that has shown even pre-COVID, Washington's rate of suicide or death due to suicide was well above the national average, uh, tying directly back into this need for more intermediate care beds that are basically what the RTF designation is for. This is incredibly important. So um, I, in terms of the differences between the two proposals, um, that is certainly beyond my level of expertise. So. I want to approach that with appropriate humility. I do want to bring up the fact that unfortunately providers of this kind do face discrimination from local municipalities while also serving a vital public need. Uh, we have encountered this firsthand um, in some of the communities, even with routine things like getting well testing done, um, not being granted access to areas where we have um, uh, legal right to to go to and uh, I would just have that consideration as we um, look at how much influence we're giving to local building officials and fire code um, because this is a vital need that's being provided for the entire state when an RTF is allowed to operate so thank you very much all right thank you is there a council member that wants to propose an action on either one of these documents Micah Thank you. Thanks, Al and Ted. And I forgot the other person that spoke. I apologize. Um, I, I was probably the more vocal opinion at the last couple of council meetings on this on accuracy. The version that I provided is still accurate. It, it does mention the same sections that was in the original opinion from Al, um, but it also includes other sections of IBC or Washington State Building Code Section 104. And one of those big ones is going to include modifications because really it's a, it's a code modification It's you're, you're not necessarily going to be doing alternate methods or materials that are in the code you may use the ones that are in the code but the modification is using a different occupancy classification to use those me, um, materials or methods so I, I did include the materials and methods section but also included the other relevant section of 104 and I didn't modify the question story and I didn't want to, you know, over overpass that, but it was just asking that can section 104, um, not just, or not explicit to section 104.11. Um, so I did modify the question a little bit. I just wanted to point that out. But if Al or, or others are amenable to my version, this version is also acceptable to the code officials because it, it does capture other sections that can be used and provides a, a little history that goes a little farther back than the original version and moves from there. So if possible, I would like to make the motion that we approve the version that I put forward as the opinion for using alternative methods or modifications to the code to allow these approvals through the code officials. Thanks. Okay, there, there's a motion, is there a second? Second, Jay Arnold. Thank you, Jay. Motion to second, uh, Roger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can uh, since the motion said refers to the version that Micah proposed, can we be clear on which of the two on the screen we're talking about? That's that version. That one. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I was clear which one we were talking about. Sorry, I was having technical difficulties to show you both. So I guess I didn't clarify that. But this is Micah's version. Okay, any any further comments on uh, on the motion? Roger? Yeah, Micah, if you can clarify, I just, the in your opinion, the second paragraph, um, the version that you have says, only when the building official or fire code official determines 
dot, 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 dot. Is that in some way uh, more restrictive or less restrictive than the paragraph in the other version? I'm, I'm the only was the one that stands out to me, the word only. Um, do you think that the other version, I mean, I'm just curious if it's stronger or not stronger than, than the, the version, the other version that was proposed. Uh, that's pretty much the language of the code. It doesn't say only, but it says that the code official can approve this when all these items are met. Okay. Um, so that's pretty much the only, only when those are met or doesn't do a certain thing. Um, under the modification, it actually states in the code that um, pretty much the approval is such that the modification does not lessen health, accessibility, life, and fire safety or structural requirements. And then under the alternative means and method, the language says the alternative method material design of construction shall be approved where the code official finds the proposed alternative meets all of the following. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's explicit in section 104.11 as indicated in that second term. So those do have to be met for the code official to be to grant these approvals. That's what the code states. And that's what we've adopted as the state. And then my second question, and I don't know if Micah or who will answer this or Stoyan. Um, so this is an opinion. We are not changing the code with this. We are just offering an opinion on it. This is how we as a council interpret what is in the code. Is that correct? Yes. This is a council opinion. And, and uh, the caveat here is that the cities and counties, the building departments, they are not required to, uh, to comply with it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Jay? One of the reasons why I seconded Micah's motion is I found of the two proposals, uh, Micah's proposal to be clear. But if there are, as one of the speakers had mentioned, if there are significant policy differences between the two where um, this this changes things, I'm, I'm curious to hear from staff, uh, Shell, as the proponent of the original language or others on any differences here. because. At least from my perspective as a lay person, I couldn't see a, a big policy difference. Thank you. Uh, Chell? Yeah, functionally, I think they say similar things. I think the, the, the difference is that the one that I suggested language for um, kind of is, is more on the encouraging uh, side. And the one on, you know, the micro road is the, the less encouraging side, but they don't. I don't think have a significant difference. Mike is a code official. Uh, he's better at writing language that code officials can understand or, or opinions that code officials can understand. So I'm, I think his is perfectly fine um, from my perspective. Great. Uh, any further comments? Uh, hearing none, let's, let's take a roll call. Uh, Chell Anderson. Aye. Jay Arnold. Aye. Todd Bayruther. Aye. Micah Chappell. Thanks for the compliment, Chell, and yes. Bob Hamlin. Aye. Roger Haringa. Aye. Matthew Hepner? Aye. Craig Holt? Aye. Peter Rieke? Aye. Katie Sheehan? Aye. Caroline Traub? Aye. Corey Wilker? Yes. Motion carries 12 to 0. Thank you, Krista. I'm sorry that I went through the roll call method on that rather than just asking for a voice vote. <laughs> Obviously, it was a uh, rather quick and easy. Okay, uh, with that, we'll move on to item six, uh, deliberations on rulemaking decisions. <clears throat> I will note that uh, we won't be taking public comments on this item. However, the council members may ask questions of proponents or commenters. So uh, with that, uh, we'll start with adoption of the 2021 IBC structural. 
And I see Micah, Micah's hand. Yeah, before we got into that, I just wanted to ask, was there a need for the council to consider the work group uh, still moving forward for off cycle rulemaking for the Department of Health to make modifications or would this, will this opinion suffice for now? I, I, sorry, I meant to kind of ask that before we move forward. That's fine. So, talking to all in DOH, I, 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 I thought they wouldn't need off cycle rule for that if the council opinion is uh, granted, but uh, if Al is still around, he can clarify that. Al is no longer logged in. Okay, well, I can I can uh, coordinate with uh, DOH and and uh, I'll, I'll have the information for the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure we were closing that out adequately for Department of Health and those folks who were concerned. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so we're back to the adoption of the 2021 IDC. Uh, are any comments, Todd? Uh, thank you, Chair. I will uh, open with as the chair of the of the IBC tag. Um, if you'll entertain a motion, I'm ready to make it. Please do. Uh, can Can I just for a point of order? I want to clarify how how we'll go with this. So, what you have on the screen here, and and it was posted on the website, we have all modifications proposed for the CR 103. So, this the language you see here changes the CR 102. And um, a, everything is here. For some of these proposals, we have a rationale. For others, we don't, because I don't think for this specific code there was any any opposition on this. But if you go, if you want to go section by section and vote for each section, that will be okay. If you want to approve all changes at once, that's okay too. However, you need a final vote for adopting uh, uh, each code. If, okay. if my yeah. clarification provides clarity or makes it worse. <laughs> so we're in the uh, IBC at the moment. Currently uh, IBC. Yeah. Are, you, are you speaking of sections within the IBC or? Well, it's the same comment for all courts, but since we started with IBC, I'm, I'm speaking with sections about uh, related to IBC. And when we get to the IEBC, so it's a little odd here because we have IBC and IEBC in the same CR-102 because IEBC is an appendix to IBC. But uh, we will, we can, I can show you the changes for related to IBC. And then uh, when we get to the IEBC, I will concentrate on the IEBC. Okay, and, and I, I presume this is, we've gone through discussion and deliberation on all these changes. Uh, there's no surprises here. So. Yes, there are some in the residential code, but for the building code, uh, uh, it was already discussed. Okay. Chell? And just to clarify, Stan, the CR 102 is the document, is one of the documents. The other one is changes from CR 102, but the changes from CR 102 documents are just proposed changes. So if a motion is made, they would need to include moving the CR 102 for plus any of the changes from CR 102. So they'd have to be specific about which chain, which document, which sections from the changes of, from the CR 102 document they wanted to move forward. That's that correct. correct, yes, okay. yes, yes. This is why I said, you know, if you go, if you want to go section by section, that's okay. If you want to evaluate the changes as a well, whole, that's okay too, but, uh, the council needs to vote on the changes first, and then uh, the final, uh, the final adopt for the final adoption. Okay, Todd, can you clarify your motion? Well, I haven't made it yet, but but now I'm questioning it. Um, I, I was I was going to, and I just to, let's talk this through. I was, I was going to pr propose, you know, um, obviously moving this here, one of three, um, with the proposed modifications uh, as posted. But uh, I'm happy to hold back if we want to go section by section. It's up to the council members. Either way works. I guess my my point, Todd, was that we need to be specific about which of the 
ones in the proposed changes. It could be all of them, that could be specific enough, but you could be more specific if you wanted certain ones and not others. That, that was my only point. Yep. And, uh, or, or if it's the will, you know, council would like to um, do it by amendments, that's fine too. So chair, how, we'll look to your advice on how you'd like to proceed. Um, I, would, uh, enter, I would entertain any motion. Um, Todd, clearly you're, you're the most in depth in this. Um, so if you want to take it as a package, it's fine. If, uh, if there are things in here that people you know, want to discuss, I mean, that could be done as an amendment or we can look at them individually. Okay. Well, um, now that we've, to make sure we don't create confusion, let's start with the base motion. Uh, so I, I make a motion to uh, move the IBC CR2 102 um, to CR 103. And I'll, I'll leave it, I'll leave it blank there as the main motion. I'll second that. Okay. Corey, I saw your hand pop up a couple of times. Did you have a comment? Yeah, I was just gonna like have talking, but was the, my understanding we need to accept the changes um, and then vote on the entirety. Is that correct? Yeah, well, yeah, and, and 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 that's um, as I was saying. I, I was, I'm happy to amend that to um, include as amended with the proposed modification as as posted under the document o OTS. That'd be forty thirty six point two. Is that correct? Sorry. Excellent. I, I guess I didn't do a good job, but if you if you have nothing against the proposals as they are proposed, then you can do one vote for both. If you are voting for adoption, including call modifications to a CR one or two, that, that that's clear enough to me. And uh, uh, Dirk, if I'm wrong, feel free uh, to jump in and and correct me. I like being corrected. Yeah, I uh, I like it when I'm actually paying attention too, so that I'm able to follow the conversation. And so, um, yeah, I think it, it, it the the motion could. Uh, simply be to adopt this uh, document uh, for purposes of uh, the final rule that is to move it forward to the 103. I don't see a need to take two separate votes on approving all of the changes to the code and then approve the moving forward. Of course, if the council wants to do it that way, they could. So the motion, as I understand it, is to uh, adopt or to move forward the 102 to the 103 with the changes that are suggested. Chell? Todd, would you like to amend your motion to include all of the, the changes in, in this document? Yes, I would. And the second still stands. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Oh, wait a Sorry, second. I was raising my hand. I, I don't know if you want us to unmute or raise, raise our hand, David. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Just to be clear, this is just for IBC. That, this that is just for IBC. Yes. Thank you. They're, they're, they were combined under one heading on the website, so I just wanted to verify. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually looking at the, the printed agenda, and there, uh, under item six, there are five uh, items, IBC, IEBC, IRC, UPC, and BUI. So we're just that, talking That about works. I was, just, I was looking at the, the meeting website where it has the individual written um, modifications. So that's yeah. all. I was just clarifying. Thank you. I, I understand. Appreciate it. Um, let's just go with a voice vote on this. Uh, all in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Todd, your motion carries. Uh, the, the second bullet point under six is the adoption of the 2021 IEBC. Okay, thank you, Chair. May I make a motion? Yes, you may. So I move to move the IEBC CR 102 to CR 103 um, as amended with proposed modifications, um, including 306.7.1 option two and striking 306.7.1 options one and three. 
Okay, there's a motion made. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Todd, do you want to comment on your on your uh, the, the latter part of your motion there? I I do. Thank you, Chair. And I'd like anyone to um, um, question whether um, this is the proper proper process here. So option. So as as we went through this with the tag, um, two proposals were submitted. Uh, if I'm looking at this correctly, option one and option two, um, and then option three is uh, combines those two. So I propose that we first look at option two here, and then if someone wants to make an amendment to include the, you know, to include the statement on the priority, or simply switch it to option three, that would that would be the action we would want to take by amendment here. So if we need to review that for a second, or anyone else can speak to this. Uh, um, there's not a hard stance from my my from my um, from me uh, on any of the options. Okay, uh, could, Stoyan, could you scroll down to option three? Option three combines as uh, a third set combines option or option one and option two. So is this primarily just wordsmithing, making it more clear? Well, we 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 received from the same person. Uh, two proposals related to the same section and uh, uh, the tag suggested we 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 post them for uh, uh, testimony unfortunately we didn't receive any uh, uh, testimony related to these two sections so the council staff at the last moment we we combined these two but we also provided options for the council to uh, decide uh, which one will be more appropriate Okay, and, and Todd, do I understand correctly? You're proposing that we accept option three and strike the other two. Uh, no, um, I, I propose I included option two. I, I think it is the most straightforward. Um, I think there might be a little redundancy in in also including the the priority um, clause, but uh, I think that should be a discussion if someone would like to amend it. Okay, uh, Micah. Thanks. I don't have a preference on this, um, but I would like to make an additional motion that we include in the adoption of the IEBC, the proposed language change to 401.4 and the proposed language change to section 503.13 and 805.14. Okay, that sounds like an amendment to me. Is there a second? Uh, here, no, no second. I would say that the amendment fails. Um, do you, um, you, you want to? Sure. Yes, go ahead. I'll second it for the purposes of, of giving Micah a chance to uh, help us understand understand the, the content. Okay. Micah, can you uh, elaborate on those? Thanks. Sure. The, the first one for um, under section 404. 1.4 is the clarification for and cleanup of reuse of existing foundations. So I would assume we would want that language in there. Um, that's shown on the screen there, I guess is, and I'm not sure where this document is. I can't find the one that's on the screen. So I'm probably looking at different documents and maybe I'm just missing that it's already included in the motion. Uh, Todd, do you want to comment on that? Um, that that's my understanding, Micah. Um, because we okay. have both IBC and IEBC in, in this, uh, I believe we're looking at OTS 4036.2, right? We are pulling the IEBC sections, including these sections in the, in the main motion. Okay. Thank you. Then, leave, then I'll not worry about that motion. Thanks. So the amendments withdrawn. Uh, Carolyn? Yep. Oh, I think we just covered it, just clarifying that all of the changes and the proposed changes were part of Todd's motions. The The reason he pulled out the option one, two, and three was just to be clear about which option was in the main motion, but I think that, okay, thanks. This is why option options one, two, and three are highlighted because we, we need uh, uh, the council to clarify which one we're adopting. Okay. Katie? 
Yeah, I'm in the same boat as Micah. Is, do we have this document or is this? Yes, you do have the, this document. It's it's posted on the website under agenda item six, deliberation on rulemaking decisions. And it's the first bullet point IBC structural slash IEBC document. And the second one in the row is changes from CR 102. This is so, the one where, okay. It's a yes, different, so it's showing that, up a different color. <laughs> I'm color. Okay, thank you. No, it the links appear in a, in a, in a different color. We don't have much of control on that. And, and uh, again, the, uh, the odd thing here is like we have one CR-102 for both, but we're asking for a, a separate vote for each call. Okay. Any further discussion? Uh, Todd, would you mind restating your motion for clarity? Yes, I'll do my best. Uh, I propose to move the IEBC CR-102 to CR-103 um, amended with the proposed modification, the IEBC proposed modifications in OTS 4036.2, including option two for 306.7.1 and striking options one and three for 306.7.1. Okay. Pete? Yeah, I'm, I'm having trouble getting organized here. I can't find this document in my list here. I, and so I can't, I can't read all of them. Could we, what is the difference between options one, two, and three here? I'm having a great deal of difficulty catching up. I'm sorry. I apologize for my lack of brain power this morning. Uh, Do you want to send you the document or? Yeah, I, I suspect I have it, but I'm not sure what it's called. It, it's, uh, uh, again, it's on the website. I will, I will show the website. Do you see, do you see the website now? Yeah, yeah, I have okay. that up there and Okay, I'm... so deliberation rulemaking decisions under IBC, IEBC documents changes right. from CR 102. That one contains okay. all right. both all right. IBC and IEBC again, because they are okay. in the same in the same proposal there in the same CR 102. Okay, now now I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just could not get to that document so I could compare uh, these issues here. So now I have to scan down. To these are on page 24. 24. There we 24 go. 24 okay. 28. Okay, I'm going to give a moment for yeah. people to read that over. <laughs> Stan, could you scroll up to option one, please? <laughs> and then option two, which is what is included in the motion. And then finally, if you would, option three, which is also right. being. Roger. Yeah, I'm wondering if somebody I'm looking probably at Micah, but somebody can clarify for me the discussion that we had previously, the reason for including the last sentence in option three priority should be given to the improvements affecting the accessible route to the primary function area is because in an alteration there is a limit to how much the the proponent is required to do a monetary limit i believe and so what we are trying to do is we are trying to say that we are trying to suggest that we have a priority of where they are spending their dollars is that in generally general true okay mike i'll right. shake my head but yes i'll come on mute yes that is the intent is to say where that priority lies and, and where you're indicating there that monetary is under exception one where the costs shall not exceed 20 percent right. and that 20 percent that you're spending the priority should be removing on the barriers affecting the accessible route first okay 
I'm I and I would be curious actually to get Pete's thoughts on that, but I would actually be, be in favor of option three rather than option two to to give a preference or a uh, suggest a priority for um, accessibility first. Um, so that's my that's my feeling. Well, okay. my my concern here is. Uh, if the primary function area is accessible, uh, that could mean accessible from the outside uh, versus getting from the primary function area to uh, restroom facilities and drinking fountains, et cetera, and back. And those are oftentimes two different modes. So I wanna make sure that the accessibility to toilet facilities and drinking fountains is included and making sure that the accessibility from the primary to those facilities is, I believe, where the focus of these options should should lie, not necessarily in getting to the primary function. Uh, so, you know, getting in the front door versus getting to the restroom. Uh, and uh, I remember this discussion now, and I it. Uh, yeah. And Pete, I, I think op, op, option two covered most of it because it, it didn't do that. Uh, and option one, uh, yeah, I, I mean, the wording is so subtle here. I, I'm not sure I really have a, a huge, huge, uh, opinion either way so okay. uh, but i guess i guess my point being is is that once you get to a a event then you know getting to your toilets and drinking fountains and uh so forth and so on is is uh should be a priority and i think that's what this is focused on yeah. not necessarily getting to the primary event Okay. I appreciate that, Pete. And so that's why I still go to option three clearly says that including the route from the area of primary function to these facilities shall be accessible. So it does have option two. Right. It just adds that because there's a dollar value, um, we are saying that the priority should be given to the accessible route piece first so that you can get there. That's why I support um option three and i think i would agree with that after, after reviewing these so okay. i'll let kel take a hack at it but i would i would i can make a proposal to change that I, i'm not sure how we want to do that exactly but that's my feeling you could yeah. you, you could make a motion to amend the primary motion and accept option three rather than option two. That's what I, I would make a motion to amend um, the original proposal to include option three rather than option two. Okay, there's an amendment on the floor. Is there a second? This is Corey. I second that. Okay. So the discussion will be on on the amendment. Chell. I would agree with Roger's line of questioning and and suggestion. Okay. Roger, your hands up. Do you have further comments? You're just you're just waving at me. Okay. Uh, any further discussion on the amendment to adapt adopt option three as opposed to option two? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We're back to the original motion to adopt this take take this cr 102 document move it to cr 103 including option three and 306.7.1 any further discussion todd only thing i'll add is i i, I thought the, the tsunami provisions were were well written and so thank you for all the work that went into writing actual code language for that okay seeing no other uh, hands up uh all in favor of the motion to adopt, say aye. 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 
Any, any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Next bullet point under item six is the adoption of the 2021 IRC. Does anyone care to make a motion? Micah? Sure, I'll make a motion um, that we move the CR102 to the CR103 with the changes included that are shown on the changes document under the IRC heading in the meeting. If I can clarify what we have for the IRC here, uh, I, I'm sure it will be uh, 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 mentioned before you vote. So I want to clarify first. So here is the original proposal that is in the CR 102 for the EV uh, uh, charging uh, uh, equipment. And uh, there was a discussion at the uh, work session on October 21st, whether or not it's a good idea to include an exception. Uh, based on the discussion, uh, the, the council staff put together an exception if, if the council members uh, wanted to take into account because we didn't want to craft the exception at the council meeting. So uh, it's uh, uh, the staff work. And then below, you will see uh, modifications to this exception that uh, Chell sent us uh, this morning, which uh, I included in the package. So for this particular section, it's important if the council wants to take into account this or any exception, or we just can eliminate the exception and, and the council will vote on the language as it was proposed in the CR 102. Okay, and that, uh, I'm assuming since that was sent this morning, that's why it's not on the document that's on the website. It, it, that's correct, yes. Okay, uh, I'm not sure who got their hand up first, Micah or Shell. Mine was still up on the original motion. So I, this is kind of, I'm even questioning if we have the legal authority to do this at this point, since it wasn't posted until was it posted at all, Stolian? The blue as, as one was the posted. The, the exception was posted, uh, and uh, uh, this here with the red uh, wasn't posted. But it's it's the same exception with some modifications to language. It's a clarifying language right here, and uh, uh, clarifying language in the exception. Um, I would, in my opinion, since that was not posted. Uh, it could be made as an amendment today, if uh, if if Chell wants to do that, and then we can consider that an amendment. Uh, Chell, yeah, that, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, that's so. I saw the the original language and then the exception in the in the forms that were posted, and just had a few wordsmithing comments to make them clear and just reinforce the intent of that. Um, with the first red markup. Uh, titles are not um, language code language, enforceable code language. So I, I wanted to make sure that the under our 309.6.2, it the title is the only thing that says vehicle charging. So I wanted to make sure that was actually in the code language. Um, for the next one, I think it's it's implied that the red ones are part of it, but I wanted to make it more abundantly clear. Uh, that they're part of part of the exception. So that's they're just word, wordsmithing things that I think will will make better better code language. Um, so I guess I I am not sure that I think would make better code language. Um, Micah raises hand and probably has even better code language. Um, so I guess I'm not sure what was in uh, the original motion as far as including moving this from 102 to 103 and, and which of these it. So I, I'm unclear how I would make a motion uh, because I'm unclear of the original motion. Can the maker of their original motion restate their motion? Uh, that was me and I'm gonna rescind my motion. <laughs> okay. Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thought we had this discussion about this section and 
that's where the exception came in and that's how it moved forward. That's what my understanding was. So I, I believe that what we're seeing on the screen, uh, the branch circuit, it's, it's, it's up a little bit without the uh, added language. That's what has been approved so far right there, yeah, along with the exception. And that what's below that in black is simply a, a Chell's uh, wordsmithing to that section. Micah? Did that answer your question, Corey? I'm lost on this one too. Um, <laughs> it was my understanding so, that it was there. So what we're ahead, talking Corey. about now, what I see on the screen in blue is in red on, on the screen from the agenda. So right. for 309.6.2, it, it says a dedicated circuit, and then it says an exception where a raceway can be run with the box so that it can be done later if the tenant or the owner of the house wants to do it. Is that, that's what's in writing. And then the stuff that Chell has put in here is what we're talking about now. I will clarify that. So right here in the yellow, this is what, you see in the CR 102. This is the initial proposal, okay? The exception in blue right here, it was added by staff because there was a conversation at the uh, work session on October 21st. The council didn't vote on it and the council didn't provide a clear direction for staff. It was a conversation whether or not the council needs to consider an exception. And the council staff is proposing this as one option for exception, which you can accept or not accept. It's up to the council because we didn't want to write an exception at the council meeting. Language developed at the last second, it's always problematic. So the exception was intended to give you something to debate on. And right here, the rest of it with the red, it was the works meeting that uh, Chell uh, was talking about. It doesn't change the regulatory effect at all. It's just cl providing uh, clarifying language. We've got lots of hands up. So before we move forward, um, right now there is no motion on the floor. It was rescinded. So we're, we're discussing adoption of, of the 2021 IRC. Um, but uh, again, there, there's not a current motion on the floor. Micah, did you have further comments? I'd like to make a motion. Okay, please do. That we move the CR 102 with changes proposed without any changes or an exception added to 309.6.2. Second. Second. Okay, I heard Jay second first. Uh, Jay, your hand's up, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going to make a similar motion and I support uh, moving forward without the exception. Um, as you look at our discussion about potential um, cost uh, uh, savings through the exception, I don't think that they are significant. And the more important issue is having the dedicated circuit for uh, future electric vehicle charging uh, for future construction. Uh, I think this is going to be the most cost-effective way to support the transition to electric vehicles. Um, and uh, the alternative involves more expensive uh, retrofits. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Alex Rommel. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, also speaking in favor of the motion and just kind of hearkening back to that meeting a few weeks ago where we discussed but didn't vote on this exception. Um, I guess what I would say is, you know, in that meeting, I think we were laboring under um, the misunderstanding that the original language that we're voting on here would require a charger and not just a circuit with a plug in the garage. And this, this just requires a circuit with a plug, which is not the added expense, um, unnecessary added expense, expense for many people at the charging station itself. And so I thought we were talking about whether a charger uh, was in, included based on the Republican caucuses letter to us. Um, since this does not include 
a requirement for a charger. The exception in my mind is unnecessary. I do think it's important that we have the capacity to install chargers in garages in all um, in all homes going forward. Uh, because, you know, Washington state is committed to being a zero emission vehicle state. That means we're going to see more and more uh, electric vehicles in more and more homes and more and more garages. Um, this is equipment that's going to be important for many, although not yet all uh, folks. And um, making sure that it's done right the first time will save us a lot of money. Um, putting in uh, that track, putting in uh, the capacity on the breaker box, uh, and and putting in the plug while the drywall is off, uh, while the electrician is already in, uh, on site, will save um, a ton of resources down the road for folks who do need it. I um, had the chance to talk with uh, folks at an uh, auto dealership here in Bellingham a couple of months ago, and we're already seeing something close to a quarter of cars moving off of the lots um, are electric vehicles. This isn't a niche application anymore. General Motors has said that within a dozen years, they don't plan to be building internal combustion engines for passenger vehicles. This is going to be necessary and saving the money now um, is an important step uh, for us to be ready. Strongly in support of the uh, amend, uh, in strongly in support of the motion. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Romo. Uh, Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there was a lot of discussion and the industry that was mostly opposed is the residential industry because of the cost factor. Um, I think it's less than 10% of the vehicles are electric. We have time and there's every likelihood that, that hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are gonna become even more prevalent than electric vehicles in the next 10 years. So the raceway exception was a pretty good compromise that we talked about because it allows for it to be easily put in. Uh, pull, pulling that branch circuit and, and making it a dedicated circuit on a panel will likely raise a house that needs a 100 amp panel to a 200 amp panel. And these cost savings were not addressed in the proposal. They weren't addressed in the change and they're significant. So. The significant raise to the cost is why I'm opposed to not adding that exception in there. I thought that was a reasonable compromise because it makes it very easy to do when you need to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Micah? I do agree with some what Corey said there, and I do struggle with this section as a whole, but overall, I, I think that the language here is technically accurate, even though it will have um, some enforcement issues from the code officials, since we're not electrical officials. Um, usually that's held, handled through LNI through most jurisdictions throughout the state. So I do have concerns with the language overall, but um, I don't think a modification this late in the day is um, acceptable. Thing. Thank you. Roger? Yeah, I, I supported uh, the motion as stated, although I also agree with Chell about the comment that that titles are not enforceable and so um, i am not i would prefer to see the four vehicle charging the first three red words that you see down below added up to the back of the sentence right after unit i am not sure if that is a something that staff can take care of if as they are finalizing it if not and so, Stoyan, I would ask if that is within your purview of um, of um, yeah, for vehicle charging right there. If that's not in your purview, then I would make a motion that those three words get added um, to that to the section right after unit for vehicle charging. So that, that's an amendment to the motion. Yes, it is. Is there a second to the amendment? I'll second it. Okay. Uh, let's discuss uh, the amendment. Uh, any comments on the amend amendment to add the four vehicle charging? Micah? Sorry, Roger. I, I, I do kind of understand where you and Cheryl are going with this, although where I, I disagree, uh, that's not relevant. 
what they do with that receptacle after the fact it shouldn't be relevant. I mean, that 40 amp, I could plug a, a nice welder into that if I wanted to. Um, so what they do after the fact with that receptacle, as long as it's there, it shouldn't matter. And we shouldn't state it in the code because it's not enforceable. That's something that's, in, you know, you would have to enforce after the fact, which we're not here to do that. Good, good, good comments, Micah. Senator Wilson? Thank you. Um, yeah, what I'm not hearing here is, and, and I don't know that I can amend the motion to amend the motion to amend the motion, but um, we're back here in the same capacity as we were with the um, natural gas. There's no authority by the legislature to do this. Um, it's purportedly grounded in this particular RCW 19.27.540 but that does not apply to dwellings regulated under the IRC. So this council's proposal isn't authorized in any state law, we should be rejecting it. The statute's reference to residential R3 refers to an IBC occupancy classification, not an IRC dwelling. So, um, not, so realizing this, there is no statutory authority to be doing to be requiring that electric vehicle charging circuits be put into these homes. There is, I'm, I'm reading every day about the cost of affordable housing and how right now it's, it's houses are not selling. They're completely out of, out of uh, the realm of many people now because of the interest rates that are going up and the costs every time we do something like this is increasing the cost of selling a home, of purchasing a home for someone that maybe this $10,000 will take it completely out of their capabilities of owning a home. And, and so these people that can't own a home then are renting and the rent is going sky high right now. So we, um, again, there isn't a, I'm not sure exactly how we need to make that motion to amend the motion to, not accept EV chargers in in the uh, in the building of homes. So, as as a fan of amendments to amendments to amendments, um, are you making an amendment to strike R three hundred nine point six point two? Yes, that would make sense. Yes. Is there a second to the amendment? This is Corey. I'll second. Okay. There's been a motion and a second to strike R309.6.2. Um, any comments on the current amendment? Todd? I was gonna to speak to, to um, the previous amendment, so I'll, I'll okay. wait. All right, uh, Matthew. I was gonna to speak to the previous amendment as well. Okay, that's Joe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this for or 309.6.2 does not require vehicle charging. So cost estimates that we heard from Senator Wilson are, are don't seem to be applicable. Um, this only applies very limitedly uh, in a limited capacity to uh, attached private garages. So it doesn't apply to, to lots of typologies which would probably be in the more affordable areas of, of housing built. Um, so I think we need to be clear about what this proposal states and what it doesn't state uh, when we're talking about cost. Um, so I'm gonna be, uh, uh, I'm speaking against uh, the amendment. Okay, and just real quick before I call on uh, Representative Rommel, um, I'm concerned with the language here. Uh, I, I'm thinking of a case of a three-story apartment complex. So each dwelling unit is going to have this circuit, but where is that circuit going to terminate? Somewhere in the parking lot? We're not very clear on that. Uh, and also, Micah brought up a very good point in the beginning of this discussion um, that building inspectors don't inspect electrical. And so having this in this lane in the, the IRC as opposed to somewhere else may not be appropriate. Uh, Senator Rommel, or excuse me, Representative Rommel. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. 
Um, guess I just want to respond to the question about authority, and this has been uh, something we've been back and forth on a couple of times, but I just want to clarify that um, the code council does have authority um, to um, include this in the code. Uh, what Senator Wilson is referring to is um, a proposal that, um, that might have required uh, the code council to do that. Um, th so the, the important distinction there is that we may um, but we um, are not required uh, to do so as a body. Um, I think that's an important distinction for us to keep an eye on. And as folks who are writing codes and uh, who are writing laws, uh, the difference between may and must is an important one uh, to be very clear on. Okay, thank you. Matthew? Uh, just for clarification, don't we have similar standards like this on the commercial side already uh, in regards to EV futures in the building codes? I, I believe so. Stoyan, could you comment on that? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Well, right. Did we, we, have have, the we have a table with different occupancy classifications, so we have a requirements for uh, electric vehicle charging, uh, but we don't for one and two family dwellings. Okay. Uh, okay I'm sorry for the delay. Um, the question of authority lies deeply within the assumption of legislative intent. Um, legislative intent generally is something that this council should be following. And in that regard, there is no legislative directive to um, install these EV charging stations. I recognize that um, we've discussed in the past the issue of um, kind of following the 70% reduction or whatever the case might be in, uh, in the uh, uh, legislation that has previously passed. But in that regard, there is no suggestion, no literal suggestion that all new construction needs to have this particular uh, addition accomplished. So intent has a lot to do with, with authority and legislative intent is at some point within this council ignored. So just to uh, share that with the group. Thank you, Senator Wilson. Well, to follow up on what Representative Hoff just said and what I said earlier, it is RCW 19.27.540 that I'm referring to, and that only refers to IBC occupancy classifications and does not cover IRC dwellings. The statute thus provides no authority for the council's new rule to amend the IRC to require charging equipment in homes because the legislature only required electric vehicle charging capability for certain IBC buildings designated in the law according to the occupant occupancy classification. So if you go to the RCW I'm referring to, it says except as specifically required required in, in uh, provide, provided in B of this subject. And the rule adopted under this section must require electric vehicle charging capability at all new buildings that provide on-site parking. So, and then it talks about the 10%. And I remember months and months ago talking about this specific requirement of 10% of parking spaces. So it's it's does not refer to it is the IBC and not IRC dwellings that we are referring to. So just clarifying. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was gonna ask the help of Micah and Shell. When we did the um, commercial energy code and we discussed the chargers, I was just attending the meeting so I could get used to the process. But as I recall, we put the exception for raceways in on the commercial side as well, did we not? I honestly can't remember. This is, this is what we adopted for the commercial code. Uh, and we allowed for the service in the electrical room and a raceway for future use. Right? I'm reviewing it right now. 
Inclusion. I think it was both required, Corey, but I, I can't remember. I'd have to read it as well. Well, again, taking my cue from the senators that are telling us we're out of bounds to have this in the residential, the IRC. Um, here, here I'm going it with is. them. Uh, Corey, what you, I guess this is what you're asking about. Okay. This is what we have in the commercial code. So that, that is the previous amendment to either strike or include the raceway. Uh, at this point in time, we're looking at either of striking that whole section 309.6.2. Uh, so that's the discussion on hand, Chell. Yeah, I just wanted to also mention that, you know, this doesn't apply that broadly to some of the structures that are being discussed. Um, with a residential energy code that we adopted two weeks ago, R2, which is multifamily with, in this case, indoor entries to units, um, is not under this, well, at least for the energy code. Okay, sorry. Um, it's not under the energy code, but it still could be under the RRC. Okay. Sorry. Could you provide any clarification to that? Would this apply to a multifamily building that with uh, exterior entrances? This is, this is the scoping here. Uh, this is what you don't see. So 6.1 application. The provision of this section shall apply to the construction of new dwelling units per section, blah, 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 with attached private garages or attached private carports. So we're talking about attached private garages and attached carports here only. Okay, okay. So, for example, uh, a, a accessory dwelling unit would not be required to put this circuit in if there was no garage or carport. To my understanding, no, it won't require it. Okay. Uh, and to kind of to, to my question about that, I ass I'm assuming that, that private garages refers to private garage associated with a single family and not a private garage that is a shared yet not public garage. That's my assumption. And I think that because the, the word attached is in there, that that probably would be correct. Uh, this, Bob, this was discussed at the technical advisory group and, and committee meetings uh, and the council meeting when the CR 102 was uh, approved. Okay. Bob. So uh, Chair, go ahead. Chair, I have a point of order. This is Micah. Yep, go ahead, Micah. Um, I think we have to go back to Chael's motion first, if I remember correctly, or I'm reviewing correctly Robert's rules. A, an amendment to an amendment that would nullify the previous amendment is not allowed until the previous amendment is voted on. And the Senator's amendment would nullify the previous amendment of adding language to a section that the current amended amendment wants to eliminate. So I think we have to go back and vote on Chael's amendment before we can take Senator Wilson's amendment up for vote. To be clear, it wasn't my amendment or my motion. Or sorry, uh, Roger's amendment. Thank you, Chael. Okay, uh, Derek, do you want to climb in on that? I, I got my Robert's rules out here, but it's going to take me five minutes to dig into it. <laughs> yeah, I, get, um, I, I might be a step ahead of you, but uh, it's not something that I'm going to be able to to pull off at the top of my head. Let's see, the, I'm looking at, uh, uh, so, sorry, this is gonna be a little boring. Section 1222, improper amendments. Following types of amendments are not in order. This is short, but so bear with me. One that is not germane to the question to be amended. One that merely makes the adoption of the amended question equivalent to a rejection of the original motion. Thus, the motion that our delegates be instructed to vote in favor of the increase in federation dues in amendment to insert not before B is not in order because an affirmative vote on not giving a certain instruction is identical with a negative vote on giving the same instruction. Not sure, by the way, if that's the best example, but I hopefully people followed that. It would uh, be in order uh, to move to insert not before two, since this would change the main motion into one to give different instructions. Um, I'm looking at the other ones real quick. Yeah, I think that answers the question. 
the effect of this one is to essentially nullify the or negate the initial uh, motion, then it would would not be in order under the under the rule I cited. Okay, <clears throat> so we have an original motion. We have an amendment to that motion to uh, include or not include the raceway, and then we have a a, a second amendment to strike the section three hundred nine six one completely. Um, if it is out of order, then I would say we could go back to the first amendment, vote on that, and then come back to Senator Wilson's amendment. Yeah, I agree with that, Damon. Okay. Uh, Representative Rommel. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I guess I wanted to, to make sure and clear up uh, the question of authority, but I do feel like the conversation is bouncing around a little bit. I'm happy to come back and uh, if, if we want to finish the discussion of which amendment we're on and the process there and then uh, return to the question of authority, you can call on me when, when it's appropriate. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I, I'm going to go ahead and rule that uh, uh, Senator Wilson's amendment was out of order. We'll go back to the amendment on whether or not to in include the raceway. Uh, so that is the discussion at the moment. Uh, uh, Bob Hamlin. Hi. Yeah, I just um, wanted to mention that um, feels like we're chasing our tail here on all the amendments. And um, I, I thought the exception for a raceway was uh, to be comparable to where we are in the commercial code, knowing that um, we want to be able to have capacity, not necessarily require any kind of usage uh, at this point in time for the homeowner, but to allow for uh, the capacity as somebody moves into a house to add in a charging station. Okay, uh, further discussion on the First Amendment to add the raceway, uh, Corey. Thank you, I was originally like, okay with the idea of the exception, but after listening to the senators and having no clear legislative direction to do this at all, I'm opposed. Okay, Jay. One uh, clarification in trying to harmonize with the commercial code to some of Corey's previous comments on saying that this raceway exception would be somehow compatible with that. Um, one thing we didn't look at was the paragraph of before the raceway. And in the commercial code, we talked about so many uh, charger spaces and then so many additional spaces where we had capacity and the raceway to go add those in the future. So I, I think that, um, the discussion linking that to this proposal uh, for the exception uh, doesn't really apply. And so I'm against uh, having the exception. I think the goal here is really having that uh, receptacle and not just the raceway um, because adding it in the, the future becomes much more expensive. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. I just want to be clear, Damon, when I made my uh, amendment, I only added for vehicle charging. And I've heard people say the amendment that Roger made. So I am unclear if there is actually a amendment out there, a proposed amendment to get rid of the exception. Okay, and, and you are correct. There, there was a third amendment in there, and that is to add the, the language for vehicle charging. Uh, since that is not out of order, okay. for I, the, the exception, then we should we should dis, uh, center the discussion on those three words and get and get that off the table before we uh, move on okay. to the exception. Thank you, Craig. Craig Holt. Sorry, Damon, uh, forgot to unmute. <laughs> I think I'd have that figured out by now. So I'm, my question is, is this a time to talk about the exception or are we talking about something else? Because my comments would be specific to the exception. Okay, uh, no, at this point, we're gonna, we're, we're discussing whether we need to add the, the last three words in red for vehicle charging. Okay, I will, uh, re I will defer until the proper time. Thank you. Pete? Yeah, I, I have a, a little bit of an issue here. Uh, I don't necessarily think we should be defining this as for vehicle charging, but we should make sure that 
that that implies that it can only be used for vehicle char charging. And as somebody pointed out, you might as well just hook up a welder to that, which I'm quite likely to do. Uh, so I would prefer some language which implied that it be accessible for vehicle charging, that it, you know, it be located in the right space. But without the words for vehicle charging or some similar words, you could put it at the back of the house and still meet the code. Uh, so I, but to define it in terms of for vehicle charging only, I think is, is inappropriate here. Uh, so I'd like to, I don't like this wording either way with or without that phrase. Okay. Thank you, Pete. Matthew. I would just love, uh, to clarify exactly what the installation process would look like with this proposal. So putting on my electrician's hat. So I'm gonna, we're gonna have a panel. So either 125 or 200 amp. We're gonna have to come out of that panel with a raceway or, you know, AKA conduit going to a junction box or a receptacle. Now, my question is, are we also installing the conductors? Those would be the wires that go from the circuit breaker through the conduit or raceway into that junction box. And then they would be safed off or would this be what we call a future and that raceway or conduit would be empty? That that would go back to the amendment we'll, we'll discuss after we uh, eliminate four vehicle charging. So we're just right now talking about four vehicle charging, the, the adding those three words to the end of the first paragraph. Okay. Todd? So did you call on me, Chair? Yeah, uh, yes, I did. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, um, supporting Micah's comments, um, I, I think it's it's probably unnecessary language. I, I think it's redundant to to the you know the paragraph below. I, I suspect that also applies that it's not necessary in the title. Recognizing that is the 2022 motivation for why we're talking about about this, but I think um, speaking more broadly, um, re not regardless, but but outside of the discussion of, of authority, um, you know, this, this, is, this is where the market is moving, where the trend is moving, um, not only for charging, but as we look forward to vehicle to grid technologies uh, and other demand response, so forth. So it, it's really as much about bringing in line and, and uh, you know, a 20, 30 year decision on a dwelling unit in line with where we know generation distribution, everything is, is going. So I would, speaking to the amendment, I'm speaking for removing the, the, uh, the last phrase. Okay. And just, just to clarify, we're discussing just whether we include four vehicle charging at the end of the first sentence. Michael? Yeah, you've already heard my reasons for that, but I wanted to kind of mention about to Pete, that this section also includes application language that I think would capture uh, what you indicated on location and where these are required. So that, that again, the application language that's in the original CR 102 that's not in this change document would also negate the ne need for these three words at this sentence or on this sentence. Thanks. Okay, Jay. Thanks. I think Michael Bay has answered my question to Peter's uh, feedback, really, this is about location. And I was going to suggest some language about uh, it's really located for vehicle charging. But from what I'm hearing from Micah is that that's not necessary given other language um, in, in the proposal. Is that correct? Micah, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yes, and Stoyan just put the charging language for this section on the screen in red so that's where it states where these shall be low you know new dwelling units in in the private garages or attached private garages and private carports and so that that gives the location so again it's not saying hey use this only for vehicle charging but it's going to be where your vehicle should be or could be located got it okay then in that case i get the original intent of saying we've got language in a title that doesn't apply, but uh, I don't see the need for this this particular change. Thank you. Thank you, Chell. Yeah, if, if 
Mike and others don't feel it's necessary, then I don't feel it's necessary either. Okay. Any further discussion on the three words? Uh, hearing none, uh, all in favor of adding the three words, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. 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 Okay, this, I think that the that amendment fails. Now we'll go back to the amendment of adding the exception for the raceway. Uh, any discussion? Point of order. Go I don't ahead. believe there was an amendment for that exception. Uh, the I, amendment was to the, the you would go back to the main motion, which was mine that did not include the amendment or the modifications from Chael. There would have to be an additional motion made if that's the case. Okay, so your so your amend your amendment was to not include the additional language. Is that correct? Okay. Correct. That was my original motion that you'd have to speak to unless someone else has an additional motion, which it looks like Corey's got his hand up. Okay. <laughs> Corey, go ahead. Would a motion be out of order to add the exception language? Uh, I do not believe it would. Then I would make a motion to add the exception language and look for a second. I second. This is Craig. Okay, so that is to add the exception language that's in blue on our screen. Um, Storian, Storian, could you could you increase the font size on that by chance? It, to, uh, just the exception. Oh, there we go. Okay. So the the amendment or the motion on the floor is to add the exception language that was added by staff. <clears throat> For the uh, for the raceway um, discussion on that, Chell. Corey, would you be amenable to including the slightly modified, clarified language that that I had sent earlier um, to your motion? Are you? Uh, do you want to scroll down a little bit there, Stoyan? Yeah, I I couldn't read it because it was too small. So since we already voted down the four vehicle charging in the first paragraph, I think that that might be out of order. Um, oh, this is, this is uh, I'm asking him if he, for the exception language, uh, if he would be amenable to including, if this motion passes that, that we use the, the language in red within the exception. Uh, Corey, I guess that was a, yeah, so I'm I'm just reading it now because I couldn't read it before. Okay. So in your language, you're not allowing it to be used for another purpose if somebody wanted to uh, run a circuit for a welder. Yeah, the idea is that it is um, that it is you know dedicated like the. In the in the in the base code language in 309.6.2, it says dedicated. And once you're running a raceway, you can't say the word dedicated. So this is just an alternate way of saying that. But of course, once yeah, the my, my purpose in opposition to this is that I have a feeling that we've got uh, we're gonna put a lot of money into creating a place that's specific to an electric vehicle charger that won't be necessary if people use hydrogen fuel cell cars or any other type of vehicle that doesn't need a 40 or 50 amp charge. And so while we see the trends, um, these cars are expensive. Uh, people that are buying these houses, um, it's going to be really hard. If we keep adding money to the cost of a house, it's just going to be harder and harder for people to buy houses. You see the trend. Most of the millennials are going to be moving into multifamily. Um, apartment buildings and condos because they're not gonna be able to afford a house so i just want to stop that from happening i don't want to see a whole generation not be able to build wealth through owning a home because they can't afford to get in there to start with and i think this is way ahead of schedule we don't have a lot of electric vehicles there's issues with processing the lithium necessary for these batteries and hydrogen fuel cells are coming on there's there's building that stuff everywhere they're gonna they're gonna come out and the byproduct of using that energy source is water droplets. It is about as friendly as you can be. 
for the environment. So I, as we, if we make these processes here, we're, we're setting up a $10,000 bill for somebody that's not gonna be using uh, the charger for that purpose. Okay. So the motion on the floor is to accept the language in blue that staff added to the uh, to the section. Uh, so we can limit discussion to that, Micah. Um, I would not vote in favor of accepting the language in blue. I, I would honestly rather see the entire section be removed than add the exception. Uh, I don't think this gets you anything but added cost that Corey was just mentioning. Um, if you're going to have this installed, you're going to have it installed in in a in a branch circuit. Adding a raceway is is adding uh, adding something that I, I think is not necessary in the residential code. I know a lot of raceways. You know, there's different types of raceways, and I don't know what that would look like. Um, kind of mentioning Chael's item on having this a dedicated raceway. That's not necessary for raceways. They're they're usually they're oversized anyway for capacity, so you could run an additional circuit in through that raceway. So saying you can only use it for that one thing, I think, would be kind of a disservice if someone did want to run an EV and a welder through that raceway. You could actually do that. Um, with certain sizes. So uh, again, I would rather see the exception or the entire section not be adopted than include the exception. Thanks. Okay, Pete. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that having worked on uh, fuel cells for my entire professional lifetime, I do not see them becoming uh, a major power source for uh, uh, home automobiles, uh, residential automobiles. So uh, we are going to be going to electric vehicles in the very near future. Uh, as far as this exception goes, you know, having run a few wires uh, in my time, uh, you know, if I've got the raceway in, I'm going to pull a cable while I still have, uh, you know, everybody there and, and Pulling it later is going to be a major pain in the patootie for the new guy who comes in and says, where's the start and where's the stop of this, uh, as well as, you know, whether or not it's a pullable raceway, uh, so forth and so on. But I'm not an electrician, but I would say the added cost of that, adding the wire and pulling it uh, at the time of installation of the raceway is probably fairly negligible. It's certainly not in the tens of thousands of dollars, maybe 500 bucks or something to run 40 feet of wire. So I'll quit there. Okay, thank you, Pete. Uh, Matthew. <clears throat> Hi, thank you. Um, so uh, two points, uh, I'd have to agree on the, the installation costs. Uh, doing it during the, the initial construction is gonna be incredibly cheaper, you know, by an order of magnitude. Uh, having to go back, open up the wall again, uh, take out the drywall, you know, and pop new holes uh, for your raceway. Now you do need to have a raceway, but going in between the joists can also be considered a raceway, uh, you know, running it with a Romex, which I think would probably be the case that we would see uh, that in all the residential EV installations that I did, uh, it was still Romex and they were still using the wall, uh, you know, but you could have a surface mounted raceway, which would be uh, like conduit, uh, EMT kind of piping. Uh, but absolutely, it's going to be cheaper to do it up front during the initial construction. My question still remains though, are we, when we refer to branch circuits, that's also including the conductors. So the, the copper wire themselves or the aluminum. Um, is that the intent of this language is to include the conductors? Uh, as I read it, it's not clear. I mean, that would be my assumption. Um, a circuit without conductors is not really a circuit. Agreed. Okay. So, and then they would be saved off in the junction box or the, or the receptacle Correct. awaiting an EV installation. Uh, you know, having the conductors pulled uh, and waiting, you know, through the way, through the raceway into the junction box uh, is going to be important, especially for homeowner adoption uh, with the, with the wires ran all the way to the junction box. That is an installation. I think most homeowners would be capable of making. Um, and it would really, you know, speed up and lower the cost of EV adoption throughout the state. That's all. Thank you. Uh, Representative Rommel. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and I guess I just 
really want to emphasize that the purpose of the underlying amendment here um, is to make small investment um, during construction of the home so that um, the garage is ready to adopt uh, to accept an EV charger when uh, the eventual occupants of that home need one. Um, it's a small upfront cost, certainly less, uh, an order of magnitude less uh, than the tens of thousands of dollars uh, that was discussed. It's a small upfront cost um, so that uh, a much larger cost of going back in and uh, retroactively um, installing um, that equipment to be ready for the charger um, would, would be much more expensive for those occupants down the road. The way I read this exception, um, it includes most of the cost of the upfront uh, investment, but it doesn't um, mean that that home is ready to go, uh, meaning the avoided uh, downstream costs um, are much less. So it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me um, in light of the um, initial purpose of the underlying amendment, and so I urge a no vote. Okay, thank you. Bob Hamlin? Yeah, I just like to say that I'm in favor of the exception that's in blue. I do not want to see uh, the um, uh, limitation of what can be used on that circuit because, again, uh, somebody may have other uses for it at some other time. But as long as it's been provided, uh, for those individuals who have electric vehicles, they'll be able to easily put whatever brand charger they want on and then be able to use it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we're, okay, uh, Stoyan. I just want to add here, I was digging into my, my notes. I didn't, I didn't find the minutes. I, I didn't have time to find it, but the uh, uh, conduit option, the raceway was discussed at the technical advisory group meeting and further, uh, at the BFP uh, committee meetings. And uh, it was uh, mentioned back then that it's not uh, cost effective for one and two family dwellings. I think the comments were like Romex will be uh, almost the same price or even uh, even cheaper. So this is, again, it's not a new topic that we're discussing. It was discussed before and the technical advisory group didn't go with it. Okay, Craig. So I've heard a lot of discussion about cost and there's misconception. I think Mr. Hebner did a very good job. Yes, this could be Romax. I was the one that suggested raceway. Uh, maybe that was the wrong word because it's an easy thing to put in and then you can pull wire through it. It's 40 feet with a with a snake and uh, you, you got to pull your wire, but I think it could be Romax. I think the major cost is the charger, right? It is not expensive to put a raceway or a piece of Romax 40 feet and have the junction box at the other end and uh, safe it off. And then if and when an owner decides they want to put a charger and that's where they're gonna spend some money. Now, being a commercial builder, it's very typical, for instance, we finish hospitals, they'll say, provide two chargers and rough in 10, so that when we have the money, we can come back and add those or when there's a need. I don't understand how we're assuming that the first time cost of a Romex cable or a, or a conduit is so expensive. Nobody has to tear drywall. Up. That's the reason we're putting it in. There'll be no drywall removal. The charger is in surface mounted on the box. And it's the charger itself and the final connection to that will be the expensive cost. And I saw the estimate of $10,000. And that's about what a charger costs. You want to go commercial, it's a lot more than that. So I, I think we're jumping through some hoops, some semantic hoops about whether it's Raceway or Romex. I think Romex is a, certainly a, a smarter uh, and less expensive thing, but uh, I think we need to leave the option for the people when they want to put a charger in, let them put a charger in. Don't force it now, it's too early. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And, and, and I will note that uh, this is an exception, not a, not a mandate. So you, it, we, you can go either way if this exception was uh, accepted. So with that, Corey. I just had, uh, I wanted to clarify, it says a listed raceway capable of accommodating a branch circuit. So that to me meant that the, the conduit would be empty and it's very easy to pull to a panel and, and clip it to a breaker. So that part, there was, there was some discussion that the wires would be pulled in there and 40 feet of double lot is pretty damn expensive. I just ran 50 to my hot tub and um, it was 700 bucks for 50 feet. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Craig. 
just just going back to the all of, I, I'm losing track of all the motions here, but I think there was a question and, and Corey, I'm not sure I understood your answer. But if I were to understand what we're doing, we were voting on the exception without the red letters that Shell has asked is asked for, correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Shell. Yeah, just to be absolutely clear, no EV charging equipment is required in the base code or 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 within the exception. Um, and then I just looked up there, Washington has 80,000 EVs on the road right now. Um, it's accounting for about 8% of sales as of six months ago. Um, and in the third quarter, there were 150 hydrogen vehicles sold across the entire United States. Okay, thank you. The amendment on the floor is to adopt the, the wording in blue, the exception to accommodate a raceway rather than doing the circuit, which is presumed to include the wire. Uh, so this has been discussed quite a bit. I think I'm gonna call for a voice vote on this one. So if Krista, if you could take away that. Okay, uh, Chell? No, no. Jay Arnold? No. Todd Bayreuther? No. Micah Chappell? No. Bob Hamlin? Yes. Roger Haringa? No. Matthew Hefner? No. Craig Holt? Yes. Peter Rieke? Nay. Katie Sheehan? No. Caroline Traub? No. Corey Wilker? Yes. Motion fails nine to three. Okay. Or uh, three to nine. We are then back to the original motion, which was to uh, accept adopt or take adoption of the 2021 IRC from the CR 102 to the CR 103. Um, Corey, your hand's still up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a new motion that R 309.6.2 be removed in its entirety. Okay, there's a motion to strike R309.6.2. Is there a second? There is, this is Craig. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Uh, discussion, Micah. You're on mute. Sorry, thank you for letting me know that. Um, just a clarification, Corey, would that motion actually be to not adopt the R309 section R309.6 section is an entirety that would include the application language or just this portion of that. Corey, I'm looking at the, I, sorry, I'm, I'm looking and I didn't, the application, there it is, sorry. Is that where it says other pen, what is that, 302. Point, I don't have that application okay. on what I- It would be three, if you're, if you're looking to eliminate this whole new section for EV charging, it would be 309, R309.6. Then that's what I want, that's what I want the amendment to be, or my motion to be, excuse me. Okay. 309.6 in its entirety. Does the, does the second agree with that? I do. Thank you, Craig. Okay, discussion on removing section R309.6. Joe. I'm going to speak against the motion. Um, EVs are more prevalent. There's more and more sales every year. Um, this significantly reduces the cost of retrofitting them. I have several friends who have retrofitted it and it is not cheap at all. Um, and, you know, the, the legislature and the governor have, have suggested that these are, these are more and more part of our, our economy and um, that sales of combustion powered will end at some time in the next decade. And so more and more people will be getting 
um, EVs. Uh, this also doesn't apply to a lot of building types that would include the affordable end of housing. Um, so it's not cost burdening, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, the most affordable types of housing that, uh, that we're building. Okay, uh, Micah. I'm neutral on the motion for this, uh, just based on the fact that the code language is, is accurate. However, it's not enforceable necessarily by code officials. It needs to be done by an electrical official. And this should go through labor and industries and be in the electrical code. I mentioned this several times over, even for the commercial code, that the, the building code and the residential code are not the place for the electrical requirements. That is either a land use driven standard or an, a labor and industries item that comes out of the electrical code. So, um, and then I, I really struggle with the comments that combustion engines are going away completely. Maybe it, you know, your terminology should be that fossil fuel combustion engines are going away because I agree with Corey, hydrogen fuel is coming. Um, one of your major producers, Toyota, has created an excellent engine that there's coming out in new vehicles next year that's a hydrogen combustion engine. So saying that combustion engines will, will go away entirely, I, I think, is a, is a misnomer and, I, and, and would like to see change of terminology there. Uh, maybe that's just fossil fuel. So, uh, again, I, I'm, in a, I'm in the middle on this proposal, but it's based on the enforcement and proper location of electrical requirements in the code. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Jay. Thank you, Chair. I think this sums up a number of discussions we've had throughout this, where we really are looking to see how do we keep costs down as things shift to electric vehicles. The way you keep that cost down is by having the capacity and the circuits created at the beginning. As an electric vehicle owner of someone that owns two um, electric cars today. Um, the cost of doing it after the fact is um, uh, very expensive. So let's do it cheaply at the beginning. If we don't, it's an environmental justice issue um, in that we're creating has and has nots. We've already made this, dis this decision within the commercial code. I think it's entirely appropriate to say we also need this support in residences. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Wilson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So again, I'm gonna make the argument that this is not allowed by statute. Um, same argument I've been making. Uh, I'd like to know what statute you could point to that does say that, you're, uh, that this building code council is allowed to do it. Micah made some excellent um, points here about the electrical coal being updated by labor and industries and enforced by labor and industries. So I still don't know how you would have the ability to do this. Um, I, it, and again, I need to get on record that this is um, th this. These are to be put in charging capability of all new buildings that provide on-site parking. Where parking is provided, the greater of one parking space or 10% of parking spaces rounded to the next whole number must be provided with wiring or raceway size to accommodate your amperage. And then. In B of this section for occupancies classified as assembly, education, or mercantile, the requirements of this section apply only to employee parking spaces. Nowhere does it say anything about the residential except for the residential portion where it says it refers to the IBC occupancy classification, not an IRC dwelling. Well, there is, seems to be a lot of assumption that everyone that buys a new house is going to be buying an electric car. We have a long way to go. Yes, there are goals out there to do this. And yes, there's supposedly going to be a time where no, no combustible engines or however you want to describe them will not be sold, but there's going to be a heck of a lot of them still out there. Yeah, because surprise, a lot, everybody can't afford an electric car. They're expensive. And then, so the, then the point made being it's cheaper to do it now than later, the cheaper part of this is that you're increasing the cost of the home now anyway. That's not cheaper if you're not gonna put it in at all ever. So here we have another $700 to 
however many thousands of dollars to do this now, increase the cost of the home, which then will be exponentially increased across expense across the life of the mortgage because you're going to have to borrow because that's included in the cost of the house. So this doesn't make any sense at all, especially when there is no statute that allows this to happen. I know there's an, I'm just going to quit there. Thanks. Thank you. Roger. Yeah, so I have a tendency to agree with uh, Representative Rommel that there's it's a difference between shall and may, but um, uh, Senator Wilson, you've you've referenced that RCW. Can you tell me exactly again which RCW that is, so I can look at that again? Nineteen point two seven point five four zero. Point two seven point what? Five four zero. Five four zero. Thank you. I will take a look at that. Um, I. Um, so regarding the the question about whether this belongs in the um, the IRC, I did a real quick search of the IRC, trying to find other situations where the IRC references electrical um, information and, and um, quick search um, section 324.3 talks about photo photovoltaic systems and inverters shall be listed and labeled according, according to UL. I'm assuming that systems connected to the utility grid shall use inverters listed for utility interaction. So I'm assuming that that is um, what interaction between the IRC and the electrical uh, requirements. Um, there is section 329.2 equipment listings. This is energy storage systems. Um, again, that they shall be listed. So. The IRC is talking about energy storage systems, which again, I'm sure will interact with the uh, electrical systems. And then there is, uh, and I, I understand this is an appendix, which doesn't have to be used, but it may be used. Uh, appendix um, AT 103.9 electrical, electrical service reserve space. Um, where it is already talking about the main electrical service or feeder panel for each dwelling unit shall have a reserve space to allow installation of a dual pole circuit breaker for future solar electric installation. So there are a number of references, in my opinion, where the IRC talks about information that goes to um, that, that, that um, functions alongside of the electrical code. So in my, in, I, I in my opinion, this is not a problem whatsoever. And uh, again, I I believe that uh, Senator Wilson's concern about the um, uh, the appropriateness of us passing that, uh, I will look again. But I really believe that that is a shall versus a may uh, question. So thank you. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to reiterate some of the things in that were said but again i think we're premature i don't think we've we're, we're setting a requirement that's going to cost um people money for no benefit and that's not a good thing and we we aren't leaving any options open for any other energy sources people who don't have cars at all you're going to add this bill um you know i know people that don't use cars they use electric bikes and they don't need a 40 amp circuit to charge those so I'm just saying there's a lot of people that aren't going to be using this for years to come. I think we're premature. I'd like to see this come up in the next code cycle once we get some more electric cars on the road. I think it's premature. Thank you, Corey. Uh, Representative Rommel. Um, Thanks, Mr. Chair. I guess I just really want to underscore the, the question about um, authority here. And and Stoyan or Derek, please jump in um, if if we're wrong here, but my understanding is that we wouldn't even be talking about this if, um, if this had not already been reviewed for, is this an authority that the code council has? If this was a gray area, we would have had an executive session on it earlier today. Um, is Am I wrong in thinking that um, that we already have this authority, it has already been used in the commercial code? Um, the question uh, that Senator Wilson has pointed to several times, is a question of whether we, the code council is required by the legislature to adopt this standard. We're in agreement that it's not required to, but it's within the realm of our authority. And so the question today is whether this is a 
um, is is a good policy, and we have that choice. Is it is that? Well, Stoyan, if, if you don't mind me jumping in, uh, Representative yes, Ramel, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know if I would say that the the fact that there hasn't been an executive session on this, or the fact that, that there hasn't been any prior discussions with me on this, means that the question is settled. Um, I know uh, Senator Wilson and others have posed this question in the past. We have had conversations internally with staff um, uh, regarding what the, the statutory landscape looks like. Um, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I would I would note that, you know, the, the council needs to assess on its own whether it believes it has the statutory authority to, to pass this or any other uh, provision of the code. Uh, if that sounds unhelpful, uh, I'll go a step further and say that uh, I think uh, I can offer uh, uh, try to be a little bit of helpful here. I can I can talk a little bit about the statute. Um, I, I don't have, have no interest in getting crosswise with Senator Wilson or any other member of the, the council regarding what the statute says. Um, there hasn't been any judicial interpretations of the statute or formal uh, opinions that have come out from it, that, that I'm aware of with the, regarding what the scope is. Um, all I could do is, is look at the word. So, so like Senator Wilson, I would read from the statute. Uh, she's pointing to, and, and others too, and I'm not meaning to, to just pick on you, Senator Wilson. Uh, others have pointed to uh, section two of RCW 1927-540, which indeed sets statutory requirements. The legislature is directed uh, the council to adopt certain requirements with respect to uh, electric vehicle charging. Um, Senator Wilson's asked, well, what other authority could, would the council point to uh, for to adopt this rule? Um, I, I think proponents could point to a few other provisions, uh, namely uh, section one of 1927-540, again, the same statute uh, that we've been talking about before, which explicitly directs the building code council to adopt rules for electric vehicle infrastructure requirements. So that's one thing that I would look to in the statute to determine whether the agency has the authority to adopt rules. It's that that mandate that the agency shall adopt rules uh, with respect to our, our requirements, uh, specifically uh, governing in, uh, electric vehicle infrastructure. I'd also look at subsection 3A of the same uh, provision which uh, I'll just read, says that the rules adopted under this section must exceed the specific minimum requirements established under subsection two of the section. Those are the provisions that Senator Wilson was reading for all types of residential and commercial buildings to the extent necessary to support the anticipated levels of zero emissions vehicle use that result from the zero emissions vehicle program requirements in chapter 7830 RCW and that result in emissions reductions consistent with RCW 78-45020. So one way to read that, in my view, would be to see uh, that language that, that Senator Wilson was talking about before as a mandate by the legislature to establish certain minimum um, electric vehicle charging requirements for certain types of structures and buildings, uh, but then an acknowledgement to that the agency could potentially go further up to its discretion to adopt policies that uh, set up uh, that uh, uh, go a little further than what's uh, required under RCW 1927-540 subsection two. Now I wanna be clear, again, no court has ever uh, weighed in on this. Uh, there hasn't been any sort of authoritative guidance coming out. I'm just reading what the words of the statute are. Those are be what I would look to, uh, to assess whether the agency has the authority to adopt rules. And there is one final thing too, uh, and this is something that it should sound familiar to, to everybody on the council and people who are listening, uh, and that is RCW 1927-074, uh, um, which broadly authorizes the SPCC to adopt codes, that the codes that are ident identified in RCW 1927-031, sorry, a lot of numbers, um, uh, which includes uh, the code we're currently discussing, um, and uh, further, directs the SBCC to a regular review and update, uh, uh, regular review rather, updated versions of the code and authorizes the uh, council to amend the codes as deemed appropriate by the council. So that's frequently what we will we would point to as the underlying authority of the council to make amendments to the, um, the ICC uh, codes. 
that's sort of the, the bundle of, of authority that we have been looking to and would look to 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 assess the the statutory authority to to make this change. That's that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the chair had intended to uh, take. I don't know if it's a point of order, but um, it's been two and a half hours, and and I'm wondering if a bio break is is a good thing. Shell, you you stepped right over me when I was about to suggest the same thing. I hate cutting things off in mid discussion. Um, uh, there are three hands still up. We if the if if the discussions are brief, we could and we could conclude this discussion in the next five minutes. I think that'd be great. Uh, let's let's give that a try uh, so we can get beyond this item. Uh, if not, we'll we'll go ahead and take a, a lunch break and come back. Micah. Um, yeah, mine will be brief. Just in response to Roger and the technical accuracy of the code and why the electrical requirements should not be in here. He alluded, and we'll just bring up his example of R three twenty four point three photovoltaic systems (PV systems). The language actually says the electrical portion of the solar PV system shall be designed and installed in accordance with NFPA seventy. NFPA seventy is the National Electrical Code, which is governed and regulated and modified by labor and industries. This code section language in 309.6.2 takes away that opportunity to design it in accordance with NFPA 70, like other systems. It tells you explicitly the amperage and voltage ratings that you shall install. That's just an unusual method to have that in the residential or building codes. Thanks. Thank you. Katie? Yeah, just to weigh in, um, I am really convinced by the inf small investments in infrastructures argument. I mean, I live in a house that's um, 100 years old, and actually it's the house that I grew up in. So I've lived there for a long time, and it uh, never was intended to carry the loads that it has now. And the cost to retrofit it, and I do, I also have a, I have a hybrid electric plug-in which I love. And um, the cost to retrofit, it was very expensive. And I would note that, you know, we took advantage of some of the um, incentive programs to do that. And that wasn't all paid by me. So, you know, it we're going to pay for this no matter what. We're going to electricity. And I mean, I don't know what it is about welders. Um, I was talking about this with my husband. He said the same thing. Well, maybe you could hook up a welder to it. So, um, <laughs> that's, uh, you know, we're going to electricity, we're using more electricity, you know, I don't see the point in building homes that are hopefully going to be around 100 years from now, that need more electricity, we know it's coming. So uh, to me, it's irresponsible to not think about, you know, what, what we're going to need in the future, especially when we know it, it's not 10 years from now. Um, so that's, what I wanted to say, thanks. Thank you, Katie. <clears throat> Senator Wilson. Sure. Uh, I just wanted to point to my letter again, one more time where it talks about the residential R3 refers to an IBC occupancy classification, not an IRC dwelling. It goes directly to the International Building Code Chapter Three occupancy classification and use. And then, so if you, if you go back to that, the argument here is that you're trying to do this residentially when there isn't an authority to do it residentially. Yeah, I, I realize you're going down to exceeding the specific minimum requirements established under this subsection, but if you're not including residential properly, then they're not counting. So there, I, there you go. I guess that's what we'll see down the line when somebody's not happy with this and they go further. So. That's all I have, thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Seeing no more further hands raised, uh, the motion on the table is to strike section R309.6. Uh, can we take a roll call? Chell Anderson. No. Jay Arnold. No. Todd Bayreuther. No. Micah Chappell? Abstain. Bob Hamlin? No. 
Roger Haringa? No. Matthew Hepner? No. Craig Holt? Yes. Pete Rickey? No. Katie Sheehan? No. Caroline Traub? No. Corey Wilker? Yes. Motion fails two to nine with one abstention. Okay. We are going to take a lunch break here. When we return, we will be uh, discussing the main motion of moving the 2021 IRC CR 102 to CR 103. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and see you guys back here at one o'clock. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Hope everybody's got full bellies and empty bladders. Stoy and his staff back and ready to go. Uh, give me a second. Okay. We're okay. back in the game. All right. I believe the motion on the table was uh, to move the 2021 IRC as amended from CR 102 to CR 103. Todd's got his hand up. Todd, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. So um, I have a potential another amendment staying in this section, and I'll kind of present it as a whereas. So, you know, whereas R309 is for garages and carports. Uh, we just dealt with 309.6.2, the dedicated circuit. Going before that, the R309.6.1 application, which is part of the CR102, um, <clears throat> I question whether the words attached need to be in front of private garages and private carports. Uh, so I'd like to uh, make a motion to strike private in front of garages and private in front I'm sorry, attached in front of private garages and attached in front of private carports. I don't think I said that correctly, but the motion is to strike attached. Okay. Is there a second to the motion? Uh, hearing none, motion fails. I'll, I'll, I'll second that. Okay. Again, with the, re, with the idea, I think it's worth a conversation, although I know We've been talking a lot, so. Okay. Uh, Todd, do you want to speak to your motion? Yeah, and, and thank you for that. And, and, and this is a question as much as a, as a, as a position on it. Um, the, when, as, as we've gone through this process, um, uh, the, the term attached is really um, talking about that specific typology. In my mind, um, because we're in the garages and carports, section that's inherent to there will be a vehicle there. And um, in my opinion, there is a garage or a carport there either for market reasons by choice or by some regulations probably in the development code that that's required for a certain unit. So I don't know that we need to be specific about whether it's attached, detached, so forth. It's 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 either by market or by other other regulations. So I'd like to hear more um, feedback on that. Thanks. Okay, Micah. Sorry, Todd, I wasn't going to second that one. Uh, although you second mine earlier, I appreciate it. But uh, just for discussion purposes, this was brought up and discussed um, pretty thorough on detached versus attached, and folks that go well maybe I don't have a garage that I park my vehicle in, but I've got a garage that I do other stuff in that's detached on my property. Um, again, you know, we're, we're applying this to the state and there's a significant portion of the state that's rural and may not have an attached garage or if they have a detached garage, it can be a significant distance from provided electrical power or something else. And so that was discussed and that's why attached was explicitly put in there um, based on those concerns of having these rural properties have to provide a, a, um, 
a circuit for EV charging to any and all garages on a parcel. So thanks. So I'll be voting against the motion, just so you know. Joe? I, I don't think it's a bad idea, but I just I just haven't had time to, th to think about it. And we need to be very, very thoughtful and deliberate. And um, so I'm I'm against the motion simply because it's 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 new and, and kind of could be very different than than what's actually in, in the language that that we've considered before. Thank you <clears throat> for the discussion. Seeing none, uh, all in favor of the amendment? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Opposed? Nay. 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 Um, Nay. The, the nays have it. OK. Any further amendments to the IRC? Uh, hearing none, we'll oh, go ahead, Roger. I don't have an amendment, but I do just on the original um, uh, proposal um, motion. Uh, there has been talk about um, hydrogen fuel cells, and I just wanted to make the point that there's nothing in this that would preclude hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Um, yes, you're ex you're spending money to put these into the garages. Um, I would love to see hydrogen fuel cell vehicles become a bigger part of the market, but I think that we are many years away from that. Um, so I just wanted to offer that opinion and thought. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other discussion on the, oh, go ahead, Micah. I just wanna make sure we clarify the motion. Uh, the motion was to adopt the IRC with um, the amended changes in the proposed changes document to the CR 102 to move it to CR 103 without the exception to 309.6.2. So just want to make sure that was clear that that was the original motion. That is how I understand it. Matthew? Can we please, uh, just for clarification, can staff uh, read the, the proposed or the proposed the, the motion that we're voting on? I'm not sure staff can read it, but I will ask the person who made it. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Okay, the motion was to move the CR 102 changes document into the CR 103 process without the exception to R 309.6.2. Carolyn? Yeah. Um question just on the looking at all of these potential changes that are in here can we scroll down to the mechanical ventilation section is there a spot in particular yeah i just wanted to make sure that this section was included in the only modifications um mica that are part of your uh motion here are just the ones that are in blue uh any anywhere else you want me to i'm sorry i'm shaking my head for those that have video yes that was in, thank you in my motion <laughs> okay. sorry i'm like oh, i need to mute i Great. i if 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 the council is going to vote on the entire package i i have uh a question here for Micah because he was the proponent for the modifications to chapter 45. We added, Micah, to your proposal, we added seismic design category E. The, the, our intent was that you cannot design, uh, you cannot construct under the residential code if you have design category E but the residential code allows you to uh, do a D2 or it will refer you to uh, the building code, the international building code. So we felt like it's good if we have the E here, because if we don't have it, then do we cover it at all? So uh, I'm not a structural engineer, so I'm not, uh, I'm not sure that we're doing the right thing here, but I want to have it for just a brief discussion. We have structural engineers here. Micah is here, so if uh, 
if you can wade in on that. You're striking the or E? No, in your proposal, you didn't have any E. So your original proposal actually was striking or E and we added it back. We have, I think, one more, uh, one more with that. So in your proposal, you're striking or E and we are adding E back to the, uh, to the section. And what was your reason again? Sorry. Again, uh, when you when you are in the residential code, the seismic design categories are uh, C, D, zero, D one, and D two. If it's E, you go to the building code, or you can reclassify to D two if there are some special conditions that you need to meet. That that's to the best of my understanding. But again, I'm not I'm not in enforcement anymore, and I'm not in design. So I I, I just want to uh see if the council if some council members can provide a little bit more on that thanks for that clarification story i i don't think it's an issue from what i remember however i'm not an engineer so maybe our engineer representative could speak up and provide some info and yeah some of these have my name on them but it's uh part of a work group i work with and so i'm not privy to every little change here so um roger if you've got some input that'd be great <laughs> i am put you on the spot i am trying to get to the page to understand exactly where we're talking about so right off the bat i'm i will see here to to the best of my understanding, Micah was trying to bring in language from uh, the existing building code uh, and uh, adopted uh, under chapter, well, 44 was the initial proposal, but 45 to meet the numbering. And this E was, I, I assume it was in the uh, existing building code. So Micah or whoever proposed that, they proposed it to strike it out and we added it back. Uh, for the reason I just said, but I want to be sure we are not we're not creating bigger issues here. And your your comment is is that the reason you would take it out is you're saying that this is the residential code and you can't do residential in in site class E or seismic design category E. I guess this was Micah's reason to strike it out, and my reason was that the the residential code will refer you to IBC if you're in seismic design category E because you exceed the scoping in IRC, but there is also an option you can design under D2 and there are some uh, uh, conditions there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, at least it was in, 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 in the old courts. Uh, but again, I'm not in enforcement anymore, so I, I, I couldn't uh, provide a better, better explanation. Oh. I, the I issue know is, that is on unreinforced masonry parapet bracing, we would not want that in seismic design category E <laughs> for sure. So to have it included in here would make sense to me. Um, unless there's a reason again that you would never get to four four five oh two point two point two in a residential building, which I am unclear on. This is a new proposal in the residential building. Yeah, that's a new chapter for existing buildings, Roger. Um, okay. If I could, Stoyan or, or Chair, can I yeah. uh, use the right to call on somebody from the audience? And that would be John Sue. I know he helped uh, do a lot of work on this proposal. And as an engineer, he would have some valuable input, I believe. Yes, please do. Uh, OK, yeah, this is John Sue. Um, yeah, we, I was part of the committee that worked on this. And unfortunately, off the top of my head, I can't answer directly. But uh, my recollection is there was a deliberate reason we did not include E. Um, and I'd have to go back and try to figure that out. And that would take more time than we have here to, to do that. But I, I, I believe it was, there again, there was a deliberate reason we did not include it. And I think we might have talked about it at the tag even briefly. I think someone asked that question at the tag. And again, I, I think we we justified it there, but I don't remember. 
Okay, uh, Roger. Yep. Um, my, my suggestion is, is again, uh, it, if we're if we have an unreinforced masonry parapet in um, seismic design category E, it should be braced. So if there is confusion and we're not sure exactly, I would suggest leaving it in. Um, so here is here is the text that I was referring to. Building uh, mm -hmm. so. It, it, it's included in the residential code. It just kicks you out to the international building code, except where the seismic design category is reclassified to a lower seismic design category. So there are some specific provisions in 301.221. So you can reclassify to uh, uh, D2. Okay. Can you page down? Just what is the alternate? So, okay. <clears throat> I think that even if you're going through the alternate determination of seismic design category um, to go down to D, you would still need to brace the parapet, unreinforced masonry parapet. So I think that it would, I think that it should be left in. E, e should be left in. Is what e you're should saying. be left in, I believe. Okay. John, did you have a comment? John, you're muted. Sorry, flipped the wrong way. Um, even though if you do uh, get recategorized to the D2, this will still apply. You're still you're located in, in D2, and you'll still get the bracing. I don't I don't think it's necessary. It might not hurt. I'm just con to, I think we might have been concerned that if you start saying E, that this is all you have to do. And really, the idea is to kick you all the way back to the, the building code. Micah? Thanks. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to agree with John. I don't think it's necessary to have in there. In the other section of the code, I think we're going to capture it. Even though I, I didn't have as much input on this, uh, that makes the most sense as far as from technical language and enforcement. Okay. Uh, I presume that the, that the IBC does require parapet bracing. Roger, go ahead. Yeah, it does. And I and I guess with that, John's explanation, I guess I could agree with that. But I'm also reading down in 4504.4.2.5, the seismic load increases. And I want to make sure that that's... It's probably the same discussion. It would be down. It's down a couple pages on the document. Uh, the quote or the document? The the no. It's on the document that the change document that you have. Yeah, that document. What section? You, you have it highlighted again. Okay. Um, now I lost it. Seismic load increases. 4504.4.2.5. Right yes. there. Okay. Okay. Seismic load should be considered to be increased or further this section. Um, so th that's the same point. If you're the same argument, if you're E, you get kicked into the IBC where you could get down to a D2, but then you would be covered by this particular. So I think that you could get rid of E in both of those cases. You want to make that a motion? Sure. I would make a motion that you delete E. You, or... you don't have to. Oh. You don't, don't, you don't have to make a motion. The, the proposed adding back in of E was not part of my motion. That was a point that Stoyan was making as part of staff input. Okay. But if we disagree with that staff input, we don't have to make an additional motion. We just go back to my original motion. Sorry, Roger, to cut you off. That's fine. No, thank you for catching that. Okay, any, any further discussion on the IRC? Uh, hearing none, let's, uh, uh, I'll call the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Okay, the ayes have it. Uh, we will move on to the UPC 2021. Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was chair of the tag for the UPC and for proper discussion, I'd like to make a motion to remove section 913 from the changes from UPC CR 102. I'll second that. This is Micah. <laughs> Micah, do you want to just remove? Well, I guess we have to go through the process now. It's no longer a proposal. Yeah. Yeah. So. No, well, I, I have it. I have it in the documents that I posted because we were expecting there will be a discussion on that. So it, it's shown on the screen in the way it was uh, uh, filed with the CR-102. I'll allow okay. Micah to speak first. Okay. So to be clear, is this is this motion uh, to approve the document with the exception of uh, Section 913? Is that correct? I was or just going to have the proper discussion and get it removed before we move to accept the UPC. Okay, so this is just just a, a motion then to remove section 913. Yes, sir. Okay, Micah, go ahead. Uh, I know we had a good debate on this and the plumbers associations are the ones that, uh, you know, they put this stuff in, they really don't want it as a technical code language that the code official can use. And so I think that gives the code officials direction. Again, this was not a something the code officials felt they have to have um, it does provide technical guidance, but the plumbing association and, and the folks that Corey represents obviously are speaking out heavily against this. And so, I mean, there, there's no reason to have something in there that they don't want to use or don't feel is necessary. So uh, we're going to go with um, how they want to proceed for the final vote. Thanks. Okay. Corey? Please allow Roger to speak. Okay, Roger. Uh, yeah, I I support taking this out, and my primary reason is that if the tag voted unanimously to not include this, um, you know, it's one thing if it was a close vote, but if it's a unanimous vote, it seems to me that we need to really uh, honor the opinion of the tag. I am curious. I guess I would like to hear from Corey uh, the. The one comment that is very um, powerful for me is that if I, don't, I forget the number, but a whole most of the United States does allow these currently, and I'm and you know I'm curious as to why the state of Washington is. I mean, I've heard why they're bad, <laughs> but why is the rest of the United States? Um, you know, I guess trying to align those. Why is the why is it okay in the rest of the United States, but that's my question to Corey. Corey, go ahead. Well, my understanding is there's a lot of ICC states and they allow it in their code, but the UPC has never allowed it in our code. And the plumbing code in Washington state is UPC. And no AAV is fully listed for use within the, within the UPC because the devices don't meet the intent of the code. They can't be tested. They violate other sections. There's seven sections of section nine that they're in violation of. And the main issue is um, even when they're operating as intended, they allow trap seals. They can't, they can't push air both ways. The way a, vent, a waste and vent system works is it allows free flow of air. For instance, if you've got a uh, mechanical pump, if you have a, a sewage ejector in your basement and you shove when it goes off, it shoves a slug of, of effluent up into the waistline. And when that happens, there's a massive charge of air that runs through the system. And if there's not proper venting, passive venting, that allows flow of air both ways, you push the trap seals out. And when the trap seal gets pushed out, it allows those sewer gases, harmful um, sewer gases and pathogens to enter a home or business. 
and we know this to be true. We fix them, we change them all the time. And when we're talking about the devices, they're mechanical, so we know they fail. Okay. Those are the reasons I know of. That, that's fine. And again, I'm I'm supportive. Let's in my opinion, we should take it out. I just wanted to hear that again and make sure I understood. Well, since Micah understands where the plumbers are at, I'm not going to belabor the point. Uh, I'll call the question. Okay, question has been called. Any, any objections to calling the question? Uh, Mr. Chair, we have another one that was added at the last moment. Corey, uh, Corey uh, found it and he submitted his request. So it's an editorial Sorry. change. Point of order. My my proposal right now is just to remove that section. I'll go over the other. Okay, changes. I apologize. I apologize. Okay. Okay. Uh, hearing no further discussion. Uh, all in favor of removing section nine thirteen. Sigma. Right. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Uh, Corey, you got the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Part of the tag, the tag is comprised of building officials and engineers and resident code geeks. And one of them reached out to me Wednesday um, and or Tuesday and let me know that there's a section, he's got it up on there now. So <clears throat> where it's it's directing you, it's it's regarding the insulation for water pipes in a building. And the section and tables they referenced um were incorrect those those sections don't exist in the code but the ones that were put in here do and they're the right section to refer to okay is that is that a motion to amend and i don't know if we need to motion to amend or not it's uh it's just a, a housekeeping to make sure that the right section and the right tables are referenced for those um requirements okay Chell. Yeah, in my opinion, the a good motion right now would be to move the entire UPC forward into the CR 103. And this is for somebody else because this is not my area of specialty, um, but including the updates here and excluding uh, 913 or 930. Every second Jell's motion. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a motion. I'm not a. Sure. You're, 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 somebody else. Then I would make a motion to move the entire. Uh, UPTC, UPC CR 102, including the changes from the UPCC, the changes that are included and not um, removed. If I'd said that correctly, I think I think your intent is understood. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second it. Second, Craig. Okay, thank you, Craig. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, the last bullet point in item six is adoption of the 2021 WUIC. -W Micah. Thank you, Chair Doyle. All right, folks, hopefully this is the last one of the day and I will keep it short. I would like to make a motion to move the wildland urban interface code change document from the CR 102 to the 103. Can I get a second? <laughs> this is Bob Hamlin. I'll second. second. Yeah, I know there was a, a lot of discussion on this, especially at our last meeting, um, or perhaps it was the one before, uh, because the the maps tend to put a lot of areas into uh, wildlife ur urban interface that worked previously. So it's not, not in my book, it's not a slam dunk, but uh, I'm chairing right now, so I will refrain from commenting. Micah, go ahead. Uh, we'd love to have your input, and that's fine. <laughs> so. Um, I appreciate everybody's time on this. I, I know that some of it was a little delayed. However, with these proposed changes in this document, 
the wildland urban interface code would be a complete and enforceable usable document that um, that I know the state was looking for. And so I encourage support from all of you on adopting this um, as shown, as amended, thanks. Yeah, me personally, I haven't delved into it deep enough to really have a, a good understanding, um, but just the maps that we were showing at a previous meeting, I realized that here I am just, you know, minutes away from, <clears throat> excuse me, minutes away from city of Lacey and I fall into that zone and as does all the property north of me. So I'm just concerned about uh, limiting builders abilities and driving up costs of housing. Uh, I saw a hand up, it looks like it went down. <clears throat> uh, Pete, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I'm having internet connections. So if I drop out, uh, I apologize. Uh, yeah, I had many of the same concerns that you had, Damon. Uh, and uh, I became convinced after talking extensively with Micah that this is now a workable uh, uh, process and that the code is sufficient to pass uh, as is. And so, uh, but I had major, major concerns about the ability of the, the mapping prop portion of it and the ability to, to, uh, uh, to, uh, 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 what's the right wording here, uh, uh, find, do a finding of fact. And I think we have resolved that issue on the ability to do a finding of fact. Uh, I don't think this is perfect, but uh, I think it's a, it's a major step over what was in the legislative uh, uh, process, which was kind of limited, especially when it came to doing a finding of fact. So I'm gonna support this. Okay, thank you, Pete. <clears throat> Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Oh, wait, Roger. Sorry, um, a quick question. I just wanted to make sure that the proposal 59 was withdrawn. Is that, so So we're voting on this um, as presented without um, proposed change number 059. Is that correct, Micah? My understanding is yes, that was removed. I'm gonna say, I wanna say that's shown on page three is strikeout, Stoyan. But yes, it was removed previously or was okay. requested to be removed and it was done. Okay. Uh, are you talking about the tables, the, the two tables? Uh, yes, there, the other tables that were, um, one we, we removed as a proposal and then the other one we modified with the public comment. Uh, we were trying to show the exact changes from the CR 102 language. So these are the tables, I believe. This is the yeah. okay. And they're and they're crossed out, so they're not included. They're not. Okay, okay. That's what I wanted to be clear on. Cool. That's all. Okay. <clears throat> Any further discussion? Joe. Yeah, and just to clarify the motion, it's to move the we CR 102 into CR 103 with the inclusion of the document we see in front of us um it includes proposed changes that's that's correct right that is correct okay cool okay hearing no further discussion all those in favor aye aye aye, aye. opposed nay Motion carries. Uh, number seven on the agenda, other business. Uh, we have, well, Mr. Chair, I was gonna introduce your request, but uh, I will wait if somebody else has something. I, I don't see a big show of hands. And okay. I'm sorry, I got that document to you so late. Um, I will show it right now. Okay, <clears throat> this is in follow up to uh, the uh, issue I brought up last week regarding creating an ERI working group. Um, it can, if you get a chance to in, would you post this on the website as well so people can get it? It's only one page. And it's kind of a summary. Uh, you know, we talked about the passages of, of the uh, IRA and the, uh, the credits that are available out there, the tax credits. Um, I noted here that 
to qualify for these tax credits, the home needs to be energy modeled with a proof software, uh, REM rates an example, <clears throat> pardon me, and also be physically inspected both at rough end and, and final by an accredited third party inspector. Uh, that modeling software generates a HERS score and that's essentially what the ERI is based on. Uh, they have HERS scores for different climate zones. If you could scroll down a little bit further, so, and just for those who aren't aware, the HERS index was created, uh, went into effect in 2006, and it, it had took a home that was built to the 2006 IECC and gave it a score of 100, and then a home that is net zero, uh, with, that produces as much energy as it uses would score a zero. Um, I've actually worked on a couple projects that have been negative. I had one that was negative 26, so it produced considerably more energy than it used. What we have now in the code is, is a prescriptive path along with table 406, you know, to, to get there. Um, using, a, using energy modeling as a performance path, it gives you a lot more variability. Uh, you know, consider things like solar exposure, thermal mass, uh, water heater pipe distance, all, all sorts of things that actually do contribute to energy use. Um, I read an article here not so long ago that said California has, has, has gone to, they estimate 95% of homes follow the performance path rather than a prescriptive path. And the IECC has had the ERI section in for the last two code cycles. So what my request is that we convene a working group of stakeholders to uh, correct the section numbers that were misnumbered in, in the proposal from uh, w, uh, WSU Energy Extension. And then also to analyze both approaches to determine if the if the ERI score is equivalent to going prescriptive in our code, so I don't know how, what how we formalize this process, Stoyan. Maybe if you could help me on that. Well, the council can direct the council staff to uh, establish a work group, or uh, a, a council member can help with that. My friendly request here is don't set up the time we do the best we can but if we get all new projects with the due date in april then we we, we can have hard time to meet that okay and i i think that this could be simple enough to, to be done in in two possibly three meetings so and I, i'd be happy to chair the chair the group and uh move this forward chell yeah, I guess I, I from from working on the tag, I see two two options. One is an official group work group that is voted on and contains a specific number of people from the council, et cetera. Another one is uh, to have less than a quorum of the council attend an informal work group and then that is not an official work group and then have that unofficial work group report back to the council. And I think both of those are options depending upon how if it's, I think if it's an official council work group, there's a lot more staff time and a lot more like probably recording it and, and making more official uh, things about it that, that may not be necessary. Um, whereas if it's an informal one, I think you could simply convene relevant stakeholders uh, without all the infrastructure. Um, and I think as long as it's presented back to the, the full council, um, I think both would, would be decent options in my mind. Okay. And I think the latter is, is probably the better way to go. There, uh, There's people out there like Dave Balin and uh, Mike Lubliner, uh, uh, Jonathan Jones, that uh, are not council members that have invaluable uh, experience and knowledge of this subject. So I think it'd be critical to have people like that on board. Just to be clear, I didn't say that it couldn't be involved if it was an official council work group. I was just saying that there's just a level of infrastructure, council staff infrastructure that goes along with an official work group that doesn't go along with an unofficial work group. That, that was the only comment. Okay. <clears throat> so, Stoyan, do we need a motion for this or can we just go ahead and convene an uh, unofficial work group? I don't think I need a motion to understand what you need. Okay. Perfect. My my recommendation would be that we have some some entity provide the the analysis that it's comparable, and I don't know how whether that's a funded thing that the council would want to provide funding for, 
for has funding for, or if that's something that that we can find someone who can do a a, a good good analysis on that. Um, that's just a question, I guess. Story, do you have thoughts on that? Uh, well, and Krista is here. She can correct me if I'm wrong because she she is the main person for the energy code. But uh, how I was thinking about this was just to start and get on the same page first and see what what we can do uh, and how and then move forward if we need funding and because uh, I'm not a technical expert on the energy code so I don't know how we will go with this. Uh, Krista, are you here? I any, am here. Um, any, any ideas you may have? One of the things I was thinking, which isn't really going to happen on any kind of fast track, is that as part of the adoption of the 2021 codes, we are having that analysis of what the ERI for the 2021 code would be, which, but then again, like I said, that one is going to take a few months to develop. Is, is this and, something that is this something that PNNL is working on right now? Right. <clears throat> let's or let's, something that can be easily converted to an ERI. Let's start with the process first, and and then uh, again we 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 have a meeting in in January, and then we can if if we need the council to get involved and vote on something. But Krista and I and 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 Damon and you know whoever wants we can we can start uh, 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 with the brainstorming sessions and then outline what what we need to do and some kind of a time frame. Okay. No, that works for me. My, my, my hope my hope is that we can do this process and then uh, go into um, off cycle rulemaking so that we might be able to get it in by the July one. That, that might be optimistic, but that would be my 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 hope. My my list my list for July first is full, so I guess I need to do some kind of a, a I don't know a, a bit who will be first. Okay. <clears throat> but we can we can start working on it. Uh, yeah. and, uh, again, we'll have better ideas uh, by January. What? what, okay. what. <clears throat> and I know that uh, WSU Energy Extension did do a, a, a lot of this analysis work already, and that was presented in their document. Um, it just simply wasn't uh, wasn't co correctly numbered. So perhaps this would be simpler than we think. But anyways, okay, good. I will. Uh, be in touch with you guys, and we'll figure out how to make this happen. I'm, I'm just looking looking for the you know the, the blessing of the council. So, yeah, I didn't okay. hear anybody being being against it. So uh, that's really easy to follow. Cool. Yeah, I think it'd be good, and I think we, according to the tentative schedule, we have an MBE committee coming up in, in early in the new year that we can discuss as well. And it might be good to put that through the MBE before it goes through the to the full council. I agree. And then I know Greg from Mitsubishi wanted to be part of that group as well. So yeah, he's on my list. Cool. Okay. With that, is there any other new business? I have one very important one and I um, didn't have time to add it to the agenda because as you know, it's difficult to predict uh, what is going to happen. Uh, in 2023, and uh, this is a draft for the council uh, uh, schedule, and we need to file it by before January, uh, which means we need to file it by the end of December. And if we want to update something, then uh, we will add it to the agenda uh, for the meeting in January. Uh, last year we did it in January, but uh, Krista woke me up. Uh, so we have it in the bylaws and we have the same requirement in the Open Public Meeting Act. Here is what ne we need to do. I I need to coordinate with Dirk whether or not we need to file the 
uh, standing committees, uh, the requirements in the Open Public Meeting Act. However, our bylaws is specific that we need to file the uh, standing committees as well. My concern here is we file the standing committees and we don't, I mean, we cancel like two thirds of the, of the meeting and it, it, it looks like cheating and we don't want to cheat. It just sometimes we have the meeting scheduled, but we, we don't have any business for uh, the, the standing committee. And uh, the opposite of that is we don't have any meeting scheduled and we, we have to, uh, uh, do a special a special meeting so it's it's a little confusing uh, uh again it's it's on me i'll coordinate with dirk and what uh, i'll see what we can do but 2023 the council staff will have a lot of work related to the filing of 2023 uh, uh codes and again you gave us a few additional projects that, so we will work on that but this is the schedule for the council uh, members for the council meetings. In the past, before my time, the council meetings were every other month and Krista is here. She has the data for all 30 years she's been around. Uh, and last year uh, we had it every month. And we had it every month because uh, uh, we were dealing with a very tight schedule and we had some emergency rulemakings and uh, off-cycle rulemakings and you name it. So the, we, we, we couldn't keep up with everything if we had the meetings every uh, uh, other month. So this proposal here, you see the meetings in January, March, April, and May. And then we have a break, June, July, and August. And you're going back to business in September with meetings in September, October, and November. Uh, my proposal for you is just approve this schedule, this calendar. Uh, we will file it. And then again, we'll keep working on it. I'll coordinate with you. Uh, and uh, if uh, we need to make a change, we can uh, update the schedule, uh, discuss the schedule uh, in January at the first meeting uh, for 2023. Is there a reason uh, there's no meeting in February? Uh, yes, do we need it okay. in February? February will be a busy month again for the council staff. Uh, and uh, if we need to schedule uh, a council meeting for something that comes up, uh, we will we will do it. Uh, March and April, we have meetings because we have the legislation going on. Uh, so we want to be sure we can cover uh, uh, everything that uh, comes out of the uh, legislative session. Okay, Corey. Glenn, do you need a motion to accept a preliminary schedule? Is that what you need? It doesn't hurt the you. schedule, and if there's changes, we'll change it at council meetings. Uh, I prefer to have a motion, but uh, I don't think I don't think it's needed. Personally, uh, Dirk, if, if he's paying attention to that, if, if he can help with this. Uh, you caught me. Am I paying attention? Okay. Um, yeah, so <laughs> can you restate that question? Because I don't think I was paying it close enough. Uh, so we have the uh, uh, preliminary schedule for the meetings next year. Right. And uh, do we need a vote? <clears throat> do we need a council vote to approve the schedule or the council staff can file it? With the court revisor's office and then oh, that's a good question uh we when we are modifying where we are modifying the schedule we don't ask for uh the council vote uh, right the, because sometimes we just don't have the council meeting and we need to uh, modify the schedule so i don't think it's necessary as a personal opinion but at the same time it's not wrong if we have a vote so my understanding, I, I've never advised specifically on that question before. I don't think there's any harm in taking a vote, uh, certainly. Uh, I, I don't believe the OPMA, the Open Public Meeting Act, specifically requires the agency to take a formal vote to establish its, its schedule. Okay. Jill? I'll make a motion to approve the preliminary schedule. Okay. I'll Is second. It? Okay, thank you. 
Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Okay, schedule looks good. Thank you. And the last thing that I'm sure I don't need to vote for that, but uh, I'm planning to start working on the bylaws and some policies and procedures trying to make the process uh, uh, easier and more efficient. And, and I haven't started yet because we have other stuff to uh, deal with, but uh, I wanna sometimes in, I don't know, in January maybe, I wanna involve a few council members uh, and I will also coordinate with Dirk and that one because it's kind of legal stuff, but uh, if we can uh, get together and, and have a, a one or two, Few, a few brainstorming sessions, how we can make the process easier and more efficient. So uh, don't get surprised if you get email from me at sometimes in December or January. Okay, Chell? Would this include things like whether we provide insert pages and, and code books and stuff like that, or is that outside of the purview of that discussion? Well, the insert pages in the code books, the code books is, uh, to me, it's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. If first, uh, staffing issues. Second, do we, do we or can we adopt, uh, can we work at the same time on the WAC and uh, 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 code publishing? And the third one is that I need more time to research this, but uh, if, uh, well, I don't want to make legal comments because I'm not an attorney, but there are some legal complications with that. So I'm not prepared to discuss this right now, but I will, I will uh, have more information. Uh, the question was more about, we've talked a couple of times in a couple of different venues about how the council functions and including providing such support uh, or such services to the public. Um, we've also talked about, you know, maybe more modeling assistance for the energy code so that we have more information available earlier in the process and things like that. And I'm, it's question is not about whether that's a good idea or not. The question is about scope. Would the bylaws group that you're convening be more of a, a group that would talk about those things? Or is the bylaws group more of a narrow focus on the rules that we have? I don't want to rewrite the bylaws, and I, I can't do it alone. And and what I was asking was, I will need I will need uh, a more more heads than mine. You know, I I, I can't do this alone. So uh, I haven't started yet. Well, I have some ideas, but I will appreciate uh, 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 some feedback. When we are modifying the bylaws, then we better we better take into account everything that needs to be modified. The same with the uh, uh, policies and procedures in uh, WAC 5104. Um, we, we were struggling with group one and group two, uh, you can tell. Uh, and some of the filings we were able to file a couple hours before the due date. So it, it, it's not, it, it, it just, we were just surviving and that's not okay. Uh, so we need to figure out something how we can we can do it better. Uh, the technical advisory groups. Uh, I mean, everybody is complaining about the energy code, but the technical advisory group for the energy code works. Uh, but we had some technical advisory group meetings with uh, uh, TAC members voting on something, uh, and, and it was passing through by three votes. That that that's not okay. So you know that there are many things that we need to take into account and. Uh, I want to start working on it and I want to have something that we will start with to start the conversation because it's easier to have something in front of you versus just, you know, flying around and uh, uh, changing the topic. So I'll put something together and then uh, I would like to get your opinion and some feedback. I want to do it with the council members. I don't want to do it alone. Okay, sounds good. Any other new business? Corey. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I put in um, application to do a second term, and I don't know if I'll be accepted. If there's probably a better applicant that's less argumentative. However, I wanted to thank you all. Many of you did a lot of work. You did a lot more work than I had to do for the plumbing uh, tag. And I just wanted to say I learned a lot from all of you, and I really appreciate the opportunity to serve on this council. Thank you. We'd love to have you. Micah. I'll kind of say the same thing. Um, I've not reapplied. I think I'll, my term runs through 2024, but I appreciate everybody's work in, in dealing with my argumentative nature sometimes. And so, Corey, I, I enjoyed arguing with you. Um, I think we're all here to do the best job possible and provide the best code possible for the folks we represent. So thanks for all the work, and we will see you all next year. Sounds good. Bob. I'd like to say the same thing. I am uh, lost my re-election bid as county commissioner, so I'm not going to be able to be on the board with you, but I'll probably go back into construction for a little bit. I have um, some people have been asking me about doing some work for them, so I'll be back to pounding nails probably. Dust those bags off. <laughs> and we will be looking for volunteers for the technical advisory group, so you're invited. Absolutely. Okay, anything else for the good of the order? All right, I want the record to show that the second meeting I chaired, I also finished early. So I'm, I'm, I'm up on Tony on that account. We, we will have, we will have a, a, a election for chair and vice chair in January. Uh, uh, I forgot to mention that. Uh, and uh, the, the, as you know, the council staff doesn't get involved and doesn't want to get involved in that, but it's, it's the time for you folks to uh, to discuss that. Okay. Damon, I think uh, Corey and I are gonna take the credit for that, for not discussing your admittance spouse. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well, thank, you guys you can, thank you all. Glad you guys solved it in the hallway, so, okay. Thanks, happy holidays all. Yeah, okay, everybody enjoy the holidays and uh, we'll see you all next year. Meet, thank you. Uh, meetings thank adjourned. You. Thank you. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you.